Welcome to Visionaries Global Media, your number one source for podcasting entertainment. Visionaries Global Media, envisioning excellence on a global scale. Band from Ringside. Tonight on the Band from Ringside podcast, we have your all out recap. Nigel McGinnis is going to re enter the ring again. Drew McIntyre and CM Punk are going hell. And I saw, and your PWI 500 came out. That and a whole bunch more tonight on the Banff Ringside Podcast. I have thoughts on that. On the PWI 500? Oh, yes. Yeah, me too, brother. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Ditch that nine to five. It's time to feel alive. Hello, Marks. Welcome to the Banff Ringside Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Bill Vagie, a.k.a. Shannon Schmark. <laughs> Sitting directly <laughs> across from me. With his own sex tape coming out soon, we have Jason Cornelius Bell. What's going on, JCB? Rock your body. Rock your body, right? BFR is back. All right. And on that lovely note, I'll ask the congregation to bow their heads as I read from the latest edition of the Band for Ringside Podcast, Volume 377, Chapter 3, Verse 14. And the good smarts say it. Hashtag boo the heels. It's all good, baby. Listen, share, subscribe, repeat the Holy Trinity of BFR. Sex tape. I don't know. Mary might have a serious problem with that, but that's another story for another time. Kick it to that west side. <laughs> and out there in Portland, Oregon, we have two beers, Zach Coleman. What's going on? Two beers, Zach. Beer for West is in the house. Uh, man, I've had a really long work week, um, so this is a bit of relaxation. It's just what the doctor ordered. Mm. Um, or maybe. I don't know. He's got terrible fucking handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> So we are coming at you from beautiful St. Charles, Missouri. It's very nice out here on my back patio. Uh, I appreciate you guys holding down, along with Vice, holding down the fort last week. I did. I will say this. I So I was going to a concert on Thursday. I took the entire week off from wrestling. Did not you. watch anything except for All Out. Look at you. And the only wrestling content that I even... Um, consumed uh, even consumed was your guys podcast and i was thinking you know what if i didn't watch wrestling but i was a wrestling fan this would be a pretty good podcast to listen to these guys cover everything they have funny insightful thoughts about things they have uh takes you know they're funny so um i appreciate you guys holding down the fort i will say that king gizzard and the lizard wizard was a band that i didn't i had never heard of till about three months ago and i listened to a little bit of them they have 26 studio albums. They're all about 33 years old. Damn. And they blew me the fuck away. I am on. They are the only band I listen to now. Um, <laughs> I have. Uh, <laughs> I am taking. Dude, a I'm very jealous of that show. It was, uh, you know, and just a this. They're not a sponsor, but they do stream every single show uh, from their current tour free on YouTube when it's happening. That's so. What's uh, you can watch it. I'm gonna. I plan on watching tomorrow night and maybe Saturday night. They absolutely uh, blew me away, and it was it was nice to uh, you know go see live music, something I used to do a lot more. And it's nice to be surprised by like a fully formed band and just have them immediately become one of your favorite bands. It was uh, it was astounding. But anyway. Took, what's up. took the week off from wrestling, uh, came back refreshed. Uh, All Out was the first thing I watched. It was a, uh, you know, we're going to get into it. Um, it was quite the change up from mm. All In, mm. but um, very good on its own merits uh, also. But uh, you know what? Nothing else to talk about except that wrestling. Let's, Let's get into do that, that recount. Shit. Speaking of change-ups, we're going to go to Two Beer, Zach Bowman, <laughs> for the one count. Kick it off, Two Beer. Yeah, this is wild. Um, yeah. Got it's your like, ass. Uh, like, <laughs> like when you've been married for, you know, 20 years, and, you know, you pull something new out of the bedroom, and you're just like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? Motherfucker's like, what are they talking about? Here's Zach with your finger in the asshole of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Buy me a drink first, boy. Goddamn. <laughs> um, there wasn't any of that on this show, but um, I would have been surprised to see it, uh, to be honest. Uh, we're talking about AEW All Out. Uh, there was everything else. Uh, but um, this opened with MJF versus Daniel Garcia, which I actually expected to open the show because we knew that Swerve and Hangman was closing. This was also a grudge match. 
albeit a little bit different uh, flavor of one. But uh, these guys definitely wrestled it like a grudge match. Um, overall, this match was fantastic. Um, the big story, of course, going into it was if Jeff had given Garcia a pile driver off the turnbuckles, uh, supposedly, you know, in case they breaking his neck leading up to this uh, grudge match. Um, but overall, this was, you know, pretty brutal. They did some, some wrestling stuff. Uh, they didn't do too much like street fighting or anything, but it was hard hitting and they were in case they legitimately out to hurt each other. Um, MJF goes over. I don't think there's any big surprise there, but, uh, he does not look strong in defeat or in his victory. Uh, Dino Garcia ends up, um, after the match is over, just beating the holy hell out of MJF uh, and giving him the turn or the pile driver off of the turnbuckles, uh, basically probably sending MJF off for an extended vacation. Um, this was on a Saturday, um, so I did not watch any of the pre-show stuff. That's why I'm going with the MJF match first, uh, and also because it was a Saturday. Um, I had been at the Serbian festival, my local Serbian festival, eating good food and drinking good beer. Um, so I watched this, but I'm a little fuzzy on the details. This is like that far away. Am I missing anything here, fellas? Now, um, to me, I agree with you. MJF going over, I thought was the foregone conclusion. How how he was going over was the ultimate question. What kind of fuckery was he going to use, if any? The goal blow obviously was the fuckery to get there. But then post match, Daniel Garcia getting his pound of flesh definitely leaves you know a question mark of you know when is MJF coming back and when when he does is he going after Daniel Garcia right away which would probably be my guess I, I would assume you'd want to extend this maybe we see them at uh Grand Slam in a couple weeks but the, the physical match itself I thought was a really good curtain jerker MJF with a nice little uh pre-match intro or whatever it felt like a main event even though it was the curtain jerker Daniel Garcia I thought looked as strong as humanly possible in the loss and I'm talking from bell to bell you know Daniel Garcia, I think, for whatever reason, kind of, I won't say just disappeared, but just fell into the, just, you know, getting the crowd over and popping the crowd. I think, at least I'll speak for myself, I guess I forgot how good of a wrestler he is. And watching this match in points, he did wrestle MJF out of his boots. Obviously, this wasn't a wrestling match. Both guys were out for blood for their own various reasons. Daniel Garcia getting the pound of flesh post match makes me feel good for Daniel Garcia because that at least is a I hate to say it because he's a baby face, but it's a positive step for him and his character. He's just not gonna be getting rolled over like some baby faces would in this scenario. So that's good. You know, having a, a feud with MJF is great for Daniel Garcia. So fingers crossed this is more for Daniel Garcia. But this was a really good, solid curtain jerker. I thought both guys rose to the occasion. MJF going over, not a surprise. With, like I said, the low blow just makes it, you know, okay, motherfucker, you won, but – that's how you want. Yeah, make no mistake about it. If you're a Daniel Garcia fan, uh, this is a great sign for Daniel Garcia despite the loss. I mean, being in a feud, like Jason just said, being in a feud with MJF, MJF's as big of a star as they have. Um, Are you so, their biggest? So being in a feud with him uh, is a big step. Uh, putting him on the shelf is a massive step um, because when that means when MJF comes back, he's going to be headed straight for Daniel Garcia. So... Now what they need to do with him is do some. Now they need to do something interesting with him in the interim, while MJF is on his way back. It can't. It can't be that Wardlow shit where uh, Wardlow beats MJF and then what the fuck is he? Been? And then Wardlow never comes back again. Like they actually have to do something to help uh, Garcia get over in the meantime. Okay. So that's what I, that's what I'm looking for. But yeah, the Dana Garcia can fucking go. He's a he's a fun, cool. Uh, wrestler with like kind of a map based style, but very quick. Uh, he, he sells really well, and you know, I like his strikes. Yeah, his shit looks good. So yeah. yeah, this was a fantastic curtain jerker. Can't ask for much more. No, no, no. I can really say, especially like uh, Three Beer said, um, 
MJF either opens or closes the show, and he opened the show, and he he set the bar fairly high. I won't say very high, but fairly high coming off the start. So for for me, not knowing well, didn't see any spoilers, I was like, okay, shit, we off to a good start with this motherfucker. Go ahead, Three Bear. Yeah, I started it, and I was like, I got home like right at, um, it was four, 4 o'clock or whatever, whenever this started on the West Coast, and I got home, and I was like, all right, uh, dope, and it started, and this, uh, this, this match opened it, and I was like, and I saw the rest of the matches on paper, and I was like, this is setting up to be an all-time, boys. Um, so, uh, next match, Young Bucks versus Blackpool Com- Club, incarnation of which is Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Yuta. And, you know, they're just coming off the match at Wembley. Um, these guys are trios title champions, the BCC is, uh, with PAC. Uh, but, yeah, just coming off of Wembley where they beat FTR and the acclaimed the Young Bucks had. Short setup, um, you know, so there wasn't really much uh, as far as, like, background to this match or anything. It was just kind of thrown together. But, uh, I mean, this was a, like, four-star, four-and-a-quarter-star uh, tag team match that was a lot of fun uh, while it lasted and um, you know, no surprise the Young Bucks went over pinning Wheeler Yuta, you know, pretty much went exactly how I would have thought uh, it would have gone, but it did not uh, minimize my enjoyment of the match while it was happening. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it didn't minimize my enjoyment of the match while it was happening. Um, I never really bought into the Blackpool Combat Club winning that mm-hmm. kind of hindered my enjoyment of the of the match but this is another thing where it's just we are spoiled rotten fucking babies is that i saw this <laughs> i saw this match on the card and i was like yeah okay you know yeah. that's not the way i should be looking at this match, no no but I, we, I, I totally we, agree we totally get, agree we get uh we get lot we are blessed with lots of banger tag team uh division action even if even when the uh even when the division might seem a little bit down the matches uh never are so uh yeah this was awesome i agree with everything you said Uh, the physical match i thought was was good um i can't disagree with like you said just knowing that the bucks were going to win i just couldn't buy any near falls but i do agree at least (laughs) up to this point um cardio and uh, will you to have good chemistry as a tag team? So if the, you know at least them getting to this point, winning the right to, well, not winning the right, but having them as a uh, opponent to the Bucks didn't make wasn't so right field. You know, like you said, they're part of the trios champions and obviously a part of the uh, of a faction at this point. <laughs> but um, no, it was this was good. It wasn't like it was. There's so many other teams that I wish could have been here. This is fine. It serves a purpose. It was a, it was a basically a setup to what was to come. So for the moment, at this point, not mad. Don't necessarily understand why we did it, but like I said, it's a setup to what happens later. Yeah, speaking of throwing together and don't care, we talked about this like this match was announced and Uh-oh. it was just for the sickos, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, I don't give a fuck like about story anything. Uh, this was Will Osprey versus Pack. And uh, there was a bit of a story in here. Uh, Pack had come out and attacked Osprey from behind on Dynamite uh, fairly recently uh, in the interim between Wimbledon and this. Uh, and he had given him a Hurricane Rana. And I joked at the time that, yeah, that's what I always do when I attack someone from behind is I lead with the Hurricane Rana right. or the Poison Rana. Um, and this match, uh, kind of like, you know, the story, besides the story of this is two of the most professional, professional wrestlers, like the most talented, like pro wrestlers that are able to execute moves so crisply, they look like video game animations. Like besides that, this was like, who can give each other poison ranas and counter poison ranas, um, you know, the most. Uh, This match was, had high expectations. Uh, For me, it exceeded them. Like I, you know, Five star scale, it's five stars. Uh, you know, if you want to go above to show some superlatives, I can go above for this match too. Um, like I said, no, no big overarching story, uh, just reversal after reversal after reversal after just, and I mean, there, I was buying some of those packed near falls. It, it was so good. I was so invested in this match. 
I don't think I fucking blinked the whole time. So good. Now, this was definitely a match I was looking forward to. I know Ricochet is the guy that everybody is excited to see in AEW against Will Ospreay, but I said it last week, you know, if there's anybody that can do what Will Ospreay can do, it's Pac. And the fact that it's it was Aaron Neville, okay, that really set the stage for British wrestling. I know we talk about Zack Sabre Jr. and obviously Will Ospreay, but it was Neville that basically kind of set the stage for what we kind of see for. You said, you said Aaron Neville. Well, that's what he was in NXT, you know what I'm saying? And then no, he, he's just... Adrian Neville. Adrian Neville. I'm sorry. Aaron, Aaron Neville, Neville is the, the, the black touch, singer. The touch. <laughs> the fabric <laughs> of our life. <laughs> That's great. Oh, shit. But, True story uh, about Aaron Neville. He came into Jack Patrick's, the bar that I worked at for 15 years. He came in there one day. At like one o'clock in the afternoon, because he had a show that night, he was playing. He was shooting pool, which should tell you how long ago this was. And he put Aaron Neville on the jukebox and started singing Stop. Aaron Neville to Aaron Neville. Stop. That's the that's the story about Aaron Neville. Stop. No, he didn't. Uh uh-uh. uh. Come on, that. dog. Come he's, on, man. He's a real one. That's okay. Apparently, he was cool as fuck. Okay, I was getting ready to say that. Sm- that smelled a little egotistical. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's just me. Uh what was I? Oh, Wall Street. So on uh, Collision, yeah, Collision was first and then Rampage was second. They did a really good uh, segment where Will Ospreay basically was saying how he has been chasing Neville throughout the course of time in 2019. They had a match. They ended up being a draw. So now this is basically, you that know. That was awesome. No. What, what, what promotion was that? It was on uh, Rev Pro. It was on YouTube for a while. No, it wasn't Rev Pro. It was, um, he, was the, he said he was the never well, open weight champion, and I can't remember what Pac was at the time. I, I think he might have been the All-Atlantic champion, something like that. It was 2019. It was AEW? I, I want to say no, so. No, it was it was it was the goddamn um, it was a promotion that was like YouTube. Um, it was on YouTube. It was an English promotion. Um, fuck, it, it's folded since, but I would watch it every week. It was awesome. Like Defiant, uh, yeah. Neville, what's that? Defiant. Defiant. That's it. Yeah, it was a Defiant show. Yeah, they went to a draw. Okay, but neither here nor there. I'm, it sounds right. I'm. I'm not going to say it's. A, I'm a hundred percent sure, but. That's basically the backstory to this. I forgot game. all about it. Yeah, and that's why I was. That's why I was like, oh, you know, I, I forgot about that 2019 match until he said. I was like, uh, okay, shit, oh, shit, fire this motherfucker up, and it it hit like some kush. This was the be- best match of the night up to this point. Like I said, to me, you couldn't have asked for a better opponent for Will Ospreay. Just for the fact, if you're going to have Will Ospreay go over, man, let's make this the most entertaining match humanly possible. If this is any precursor of what Ricochet and Will Ospreay is going to be, I cannot fucking wait. Pac, unfortunately, takes the L, but once again, sets up more shit down the line. I thought this was an amazing match. I think Pac does not get the credit that he deserves, especially when you see him in a match against Will Ospreay. You have this kind of result. Man, I don't want to say he's underrated, but... Maybe he just doesn't get the flowers. Like I said, he he deserves. I, I mean, thought this was really good, really good. Like I, I said, match of the night to this point. Match of the night, period, for me. Um, I don't know how Osprey keeps doing it. Um, he is – it's the age of Osprey, like I've said. Like everybody, like everybody basically knows this is uh, – that we are living in the era of Osprey. And um, – this match just did not disappoint. It was very mm-hmm. New Japanish, uh, with the many, many reversals. At uh, the ending sequence was fucking amazing. That was definitely New Japan. Like, uh, like seriously, like as you know, as good as any New Japan finish, you know, that we've seen, except for maybe like okay, the Okada Omega, but um, like really, like if this if this had more story behind it, we'd probably be talking about it as a match of the year candidate. I would agree. Yeah, um, you know, if Ricochet can even have just a match approaching this good with Osprey, that's fantastic. I mean, those are some fucking shoes to fill. I mean, that'd be like if Samantha Urban had dated Braun Strowman before she dated Ricochet. It'd be like really hard to fill. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I know this is the visual media, but my face was like, what the fuck? <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the reason that I, you know, have such high expectations for that match is Will Ospreay. I mean, yeah, I bet I bet uh, Zach would be into a Will Ospreay mismatch right now. <laughs> Just to see if he can pull a four star match out of Miz, that would Stop. be something to see. Uh, you know he could. Man, y'all act like the Miz yeah. is the most horrible wrestler on the Not planet. Me. Not me. That's all Zach. Put some yeah. respect on it, man. So but, uh, after this match, I was like, who are the four bastards that have to follow this match? And it turns out, and I was like, oh, my God, it's Willow and Chris. I was like, of course. Like, they put, like, a women's match after it. But I forgot they were doing a Chicago street fight. And holy shit, it did not take long for them to just fucking turn up the awesome. And the crowd was into this. The crowd was not tired after going nuts for Osprey and Pac. Uh, these women laid it all on the line. This was the best women's match uh, in AEW this year, for sure. It's definitely on my list of, like, women's match of the year. Um, they just laid it out there. And I'm not normally always into, like, gimmicks and stuff, uh, but this street fight was awesome. Uh, I I just can't gush enough. Uh, and they've, they've also built that up for a long time, so they're supposed to... Uh, it's a big grudge match, and there's the one point where, like, Chris is picking up Willow or Will's picking up Chris, and they're like, they're in the middle of the ring. They finally made their way back to the ring. They're exhausted. And they're, like, holding each other up. They're so exhausted. And they're, like, almost, like, crying. But they're, like, still angry at each other. And they're, like, we got to finish this thing. And it was just, uh, it was really, really well done. I, I love this match. This could have been match of the night on any other um, card that wasn't so filled with fucking amazing matches. I'll go one further. I'll say it's the best AEW women's match ever. Uh, I like it more than Britt Breaker and Thunder Rosa in that... I think it was a steel cage, or it was like a ladder like, match or something. Like out, yeah, yeah, match or whatever. Yeah, it, it was a step to it. I fucking loved this match, and good on the crowd, and good on the performers for getting the crowd right back into it. Because, like Zach said, that crowd could have easily, you know, checked out, checked out, taken a shower. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they decided not. I feel to. like I needed a shower after this. <laughs> um, this match was awesome. Uh, I'm a I'm a Willow Night Willow Nightingale is the real deal. Uh, Chris Statlander, um, over uh, overshot my expectations for her. She was tremendous. They did a bunch of fun spots. Uh, you know, we'll get to the gore and the extreme stuff on this. Uh, card coming up later, but I mean, doing the splits on thumb ta- thumbtacks ain't nothing, mm. you know. She did that. I was like, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> good for her. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. I'm surprised she won though. I'm not. Yeah, I think Jason and I both picked her, so I kind of. But this was not for the CMLL championship. No. Yeah, I probably should have been clued in whenever they said it wasn't for the title. I think it was supposed to be, and then it wasn't. So like, yeah. Apparently, what I've heard uh, is that CMLL <laughs> did not sanction it because CNL, CMLL does not do uh, super violent stuff. It's all supposed to be very uh, clean and not bloody. Okay. So that's, that's then that wasn't this. I'll say that much. Um, no, I had I had expectations for this. Honestly, I mean the story. The feud itself was good. They obviously had the friendship or whatever, and that turned sideways. They had the sit down on collision on, uh, what was that, Friday night or whatever the case may be. So, I mean, you know, that just added to, you know, more of my anticipation for this match. This was a tough, like uh, Zach said, this was a tough spot to be in, and they they executed well, and they they came right out with it. I mean, no fucking around. Um, I like both women. This is something that I would like to see a year from now for, you know, some stakes, the AEW women's title, because you can easily plug and play these two in a feud with the title involved and people will get invested into it. This wasn't a match that I was really, like, high on. I was curious to see how this was going to work because both women together and separately had, you know, 
extreme matches or whatever you want to call it, Chicago street fights or whatever, where all kinds of shit has came out and they've executed well. Now having them mat in the match together with you know, a storyline that had me invested, this was a really good match. Like Zach said, it was one to watch. And I, I was very, very pleasantly surprised on how well the overall match was in a spot where they was probably not set up for success. Yeah. Uh, it seems like they are building to that Will and Ricochet match because they had Ricochet. Will backstage, he was talking shit about Ricochet. Ricochet approaches him uh, for talking shit. Um, you know, Ricochet not known for his mic work, but this was, this was good. Uh, it was like a believable situation, like some beef between old friends. Little Bill uh, wasn't even talking shit, though. He was just being like, yeah, I know Ricochet's around here. Yeah, let's have a match. It's like, okay, Ricochet just got all pissed off. Hey man. No, he has been like in the in the all in presser and then also he kind of applied it here, kind of like you need to get in line. Like uh he's like kind of like big time in them a little bit. Like Osprey's being a little heelish, like too ricochet. It's kind of interesting. That was part of the the setup for the Sammy Guevara match on uh Dynamite. Commentary was like, you know, Will Ospreay, it's basically like, you know, you got to, you know, build your resume, build up your wins before you even talk about me. So in that scenario, yeah, I'm, if I'm Ricochet, fuck you, motherfucker. Act like you know. Do, do we have to keep bringing up the 20, the, you know, 20 whatever match it was in 16. New Japan? Okay. Eight years ago. That okay. Was a long time ago. Look, man. A lot of things. Ha we weren't even doing the podcast back then. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things have happened at that point. Was that 2016? Am I wrong in that? Or, uh, I feel like it was 2016. No, you're right. I was, was super. Genius. I was bartending at like Elijah P's, and uh, my buddy TJ, uh, he worked in the kitchen, and he was like, "Dude, he's like, you see that five star Will Ospreay Ricochet match?" And I was like, "No," and he was like, "You gotta watch it." And then and you, uh, you were like, "Who?" No, he would no, 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 he would knew. I was about to say if any of us at that point he would have known. You knew who Will Osprey yeah. was in two thousand sixteen? Yeah, I mean like I watched like uh like the B O S J and stuff. I didn't watch like all the time, but I watched like G one and stuff and uh um like followed those 'cause because of like mostly T J uh was keeping me abreast of that stuff. But uh yeah. It's gonna be a fun match. No, no doubt. Yeah, anyway, uh, we, yeah, we can talk about it now real quick, just to tie it all in. Uh, Ricochet and Sammy, really good match. Uh, Ricochet looked pretty strong. Uh, you know, no, no really near falls or anything. Um, it was very much a kind of a definite win. Um, you know, uh, Sammy's just now kind of getting back, getting his legs under him. He's uh, a nice he is, guy again. You know, He's a nice guy. That yeah, motherfucker was still getting with... booed a little bit. I was like, damn, he just can't just <laughs> leave that man alone. <laughs> He's a baby He's face. got a very punchable face. It's very hard. He's got a very punchable face and a very hot wife, and everybody knows it. So, like, he's, he's an easy guy to hate. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, uh, fun match, though. And, um, you know, I forgot – how much I miss seeing Sammy Guevara. Like, there's so many guys in the roster, and there's so many people you don't see that you feel like you should. And he's been off for like legitimate reasons. You know, he's like paternity leave and stuff. And like, uh, you know, I was just like, man, I was like, this fucking show is better with Sammy Guevara on it. Like, he was kind of a a major fulcrum of you know pandemic dynamite and stuff. Like, uh, it was it was kind of nostalgic to see him wrestling again, even though he's a young guy. Yeah, I was cool with uh, – I, I didn't know why Mortos got involved, but I guess Mortos is going to be Ricochet's next victory, um, which is yeah, fine. They're which is going to be a dope match. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're setting That's it up. That's why they sold it. I was like, okay, shit, they, let's they, do this. They set it up with something. It'd be nice to hear from Mortos to know why he did that, but, I mean, I, I'm not holding my breath for that. I, honestly, I, I mean – I would like to see a, more of a storyline of the why, but this is AEW. This is fine. It's very New Japan-ish. I'm okay with that. Ultimately, we know why uh, Mortos is there, and that's fine. It's to get you know Ricochet the dub. 
the match should be good. And that's fine, too. This is their reason why. It just happens quick. Tony's, you know how Tony works. Shit, it's, you know, microwave type shit. Boom, next one. Boom, next yeah. one. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Mortos has a vanity license plate that's OMW2BYB. It's on my way to be your base. He's just the best <laughs> base for those little guys. <laughs> then we had um, microwave we, style. Yeah, I know microwave style, like Miami in the '80s microwave style. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we had the uh, AW Continental Championship four way with Okada, Orange Cassidy, Takeshita, and Mark Briscoe, and this thing was fucking awesome. Like, I mean, but like, really, look at that lineup. It's Kazuchika Okada. One of the best wrestlers of this generation. It's Orange Cassidy, one of the most over guys, and just always puts on a fucking banger fun match. Kanosuke Takeshita, the future Okada, like the best wrestler of like the next generation, and then Mark Briscoe, who just adds flavor and fun, and has been doing this fucking thing and putting on fantastic wrestling performances with and without his brother for fifteen fucking years or more. And oh, and he just, just happens to be the there. ROH world champion. <laughs> and he's the ROH world champion, yes. Um, which you kind of forget about. But, um, yeah, uh, and uh, this was fantastic. Uh, kind of surprising that uh, Orange Cassidy was the one to take the pin, but then it, it was very good because Takeshi did not take the pin. Briscoe taking the pin would have added implications for the Ring of Honor world title. Uh, I threw in a kind of a, a random like to catch the pick just because we didn't really know who the people were, so it was kind of hard like to pick. Um, but it looks like because they are not doing that, that Takeshita is going to be getting uh, that world or the continental title match against Okada. Seems like they're going to do the singles match, and God damn it, I hope they do it for me in Tacoma whenever I'm there live because oh, uh, that's going to be a dope show. I mean, think about it. We're getting Okada Takeshita. Takeshita coming off a fucking red hot G1 performance. And Okada, who we talked about, or maybe you guys talked about last week, like he is, you know, he's putting forth as much effort as he has to, but he's enjoying his paycheck and he's they're saving the big matches for, you know, big matches, it seems like. And Takeshita Okada is going to be a fucking. Uh, headbanger, man. I cannot wait for that match. Super, super uh, high expectations for that match, and my interest level is as high as it can get. No, TK is definitely uh, cooking that motherfucker up. It's on that nice little slow boil that uh, slowly but surely when we get that match, it. Yeah, I'm ready for that. I want to get nice and ripped, wait about 20 minutes, and then press play. That's the ideal way to watch that match, and that's what I'm going to try to do. <laughs> Put my phone down and just enjoy it. No, this this four-way was good, though. Don't don't get it twisted. I thought all four guys had their moments. Uh, uh, the chemistry was good no matter who was in the ring or outside of the ring. Okada just, like I said, for me, watching him be this heel – this kind of almost over the top heel is still taking some use to, but I would be lying if I said it was not entertaining. I just love how it just it, you see the the punchline coming and you still laugh. That's what to me makes it funny. So for the in that scenario, this twist on Okada is good. I agree with Zach that to, to catch the not getting pinned even. Orange Cassidy getting pinned, it's fine. Nobody even blinked when that sh- – I didn't even blink. I was just like, oh, damn, you know. They- I'll say this about Takeshita, too. You know, fast forward to Dynamite when Callis was doing his talking for him, and Takeshita was also hanging out when Osprey and Fletcher decided to be the tag team for the gauntlet match, is that with no lines, Takeshita, they're doing some character building with him uh, through his expressions and mannerisms and also – uh, the uh, the announcers are saying, talking about how Takeshita, you know, can tell that he was the one looked over for the tag team when uh, Callis was doing his talking for him. Takeshita's kind of got this resigned look on his face, like, listen, man, I'm, I, like, he knows how badass he is. That motherfucker and that, looks salty as fuck. Yes, <laughs> salty, thank you, salty, that's the word I'm looking for. He, he, he looked over there and Todd Callis like, nigga, what you say? And he's, you know, and he... He didn't look scared of Okada. 
I fell out. I was like, man, no. Then give props to Osprey. Looked at him kind of like, I will bust you in your mouth if you say something smart right now. Man, I cannot wait for this match. Like I said, this Fatal 4-Way was good. Don't get me wrong. Love me some Mark Briscoe. I wish I had more time to watch ROH and so I could watch Mark Briscoe be the ROH champion. Like I said, for me, Orange Cassidy getting pinned didn't even make me blink that much. Orange Cassidy is about as Teflon as it gets, over as fuck, not a problem. You know what I'm saying? He, you know, automatically, unfortunately, he's going right back to Jericho for a little bit, and that'll be fine too. You know, hopefully, you know, they can get away from that for Orange Cassidy's sake sooner versus later. But, you know, ultimately, like you said, and we said, Okada versus Takeshita is the spinoff from this. And if they can wait until, you know, uh, past Grand Slam, whatever's after Grand Slam, I would love to see it at that point. Shit, that that would make me a very, very happy camper because the more the longer we, we wait is the more we anticipate this match and the more it will deliver. I know it will deliver. Sooner the better. Yeah, I'm fingers crossed for Russell Green, but uh, you're right. Sketchin is ready for a babyface turn, um, and him being overlooked by Callis is – just uh, the precursor to that. Um, yeah, good storytelling. And, man, Okada having a lot of fun with this. You can tell he's having a lot of fun. Um, you know, he was doing the thing on Dynamite where he was, like, talking about how difficult it was, you know, to challenge, uh, you know, three other people in, in the Continental Classic in this match. Uh, and he's, like, crying because it's, like, so hard and then he's just like straight face and he just does like the, the flip and he's like no it was easy <laughs> and then he, he even like uh, you know Callis came up and said you know you didn't think to catch it and they set up the whole thing and he even like walked away he's like uh He's like, I didn't pin to catch it. He's like, but I will pin to catch it. And he walked away, and then he comes back, and he's a bitch. <laughs> Man, <laughs> hell no, dude. So, if, so much fun. If Takeshita does get a babyface run, should Takeshita have a babyface manager? No. I just think he splits. Um, and I don't think he's I, – uh, I think he can speak some English. I just think he doesn't. What would you think about, because his role is kind of nebulous on TV right now anyway, what, what would you think about Christopher Daniels, like, abandoning a authority figure role and taking on a baby face to catch the manager role? I'm just sitting here thinking, it's like, man, I want the world for Takeshita, and I want him to be in the heavyweight title picture eventually, and same, the sooner the better. And I just think having somebody that could talk for him would help Christopher Daniels. You know who's perfect? Who? Kenny Omega. I mean, that would They be, both have history with Callis. That, I mean, that would be completely money, especially because mm. it could get Kenny back on television. The, yeah, uh, even if he's not taking bumps, he, you know, he can still... Because wrestling is better when Kenny Omega is in it. Not disagree with that. The only reason I'm going to disagree with this with you guys slightly is this is AEW. As much as AEW is sports entertainment to a certain degree, uh, I think AEW kind of leads or try to lead with its wrestling. And Takeshita not having a someone to speak for him isn't the end of the world because he arguably is one of the better wrestlers well, on their roster. It is if he's going to be world champion. If you set up stories right... I don't think you you have to really lean on him speaking English. You got to figure. We have to understand and figure out how much English does he know, and can he? How much can he speak fluently, and then work off of that? If it's limited, then obviously you have to do more storytelling. If he could speak fluent English, then you know you can lean on him to work promos like normal quote unquote uh, wrestling segments are. For me, like I said, his wrestling speaks for itself. I don't think he needs it. That's just me. Uh, so, yeah, at this point, the figure, I was like, holy shit, this is shaping up to be like an all-timer. And then we had the Mercedes and Sheeta match. And holy geez, um, Camille was banned from ringside, unfortunately, because she might have been able to do something here. Uh, but this thing was just not good. Um, like it was kind of clunky and then 
Uh, it just got worse whenever Sheeta just kicked Mercedes right in the fucking head. And then yeah, they ass. followed that up with another spot where Sheeta kicked her in the fucking head again. So Mercedes just rolled out of the ring. Like, it was just like, get me the fuck away from this person who has just kicked me in the head twice in 15 seconds. Um, this was like, this was just not a good match. The crowd was dead. Um, you know, maybe at this point, you know, it was just part of the flow, but, uh, this was by far the worst match on the card and, uh, everything else like really was very good. And, uh, this was just not, I will agree with that. No, no, no question. It just doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. No, she, at least Sheeta took it better than the other women have done it, okay? At least I was like, okay, that was not bad. It wasn't the best one I've seen. You know, it wasn't the worst. Clearly, we've seen far worse. I'm in agreement with you. Ultimately, and I said it before, that move's just got to go. Go back to the submission move. We, You threw up like four or five mentions of how we can name the new move. If it can't be the bank statement, you know, we can go with something else. Doesn't matter. I'm not as... I forgot about that. I came up with a bunch. Yeah, no. Not nearly as down <laughs> as you are about this match. Was it the worst match of the night? Yeah, no question about that. I think we can all agree upon that. I thought we were going pretty well up until like the last seven or eight minutes where for whatever reason uh Sheeta was trying to do the katana finishing move and that's where it started to get clunky from that point on i agree with everything that you said i would not sit up here and sit here and say that this was worse than her and Britt baker i had more expectations no, for that it was not. i had more expectations for that and that shit was a hot Dumpster fire right from the start. That's a this, low bar, man. No, look, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying that this match is going to, you know, smash the, you know, the standard we have for women's wrestling. Far from it. I thought for the most part this was good up until the, like I said, the last seven or eight minutes. That's when it started to get a little bumpy. From that point, say what y'all want. Doesn't matter, neither here nor there. She'd have served her purpose. She served up to Mercedes Monet. Commentary said it best about Mercedes. She can do it without Camille, which is probably not the best thing you should be saying, especially this early in the Camille Mercedes Monet run. Neither here nor there. They both were set up for a reason. Mercedes to get her over as a wrestler, hopefully to wash out the, the taste out of Britt Baker's mouth for that match. Clearly, that didn't work. Sheeta was just set up to it's time, that. It's time for us to take a look at ourselves in the mirrors and ask ourselves a pretty tough question. Is it possible that Sasha Banks, Mercedes Monet, just isn't that good? Is it possible, it's possible that we have these memories of her being fucking really good there for a few years, and when you really want to break it down, uh, WrestleMania match against Bianca Belair aside... She was Charlotte fucking Bailey. awesome against Charlotte and Bailey. Um, and, you know, everything else is just okay. She's a bad promo. Uh, she, um, you know, has her, she's supposed to be there because she's good in the ring. And her last few outings, you know, you can blame it on chemistry and you can blame it on, you know, unwilling opponents or whatever the fuck's going on with Brett Break Breaker. But, like, ultimately... Like, you got to have results, and we haven't seen results with Mercedes Monet. I mean, if if her if her stint in AEW lasts another year, let's say, and we just get a bunch of okay matches, then there's no way that we'll be able to look back on this as anything but a, a failure. Three beer? Yeah, I mean, she's she comes across like a star, but like her – wrestling in AEW has been a disappointment. Maybe it has something to do with injury. I know that can get in a lot of wrestlers' heads um, also. Uh, coming back, you know, that was a long, you know, that was a bad injury that she had that match versus Willow. It took her a long time to come back, so maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. I'm not a, I'm, I'm, you know, that's not my, my forte. Uh, but, yeah, it is been lackluster and you know two dozen in a row and what are supposed to be pretty big matches and you know her and Britt was kind of more of like a star versus star match um Sheeta and her this should have been a good match uh they're both 
supposed to be very good wrestlers. Yeah, you know? they they brought in she. I mean, like you said, Britt Baker versus Mercedes was supposed to be that was supposed that was a big match on paper. Um, they built it up. They treated it like it was a big match. It got a lot of television time. The Sheeta match was supposed to be the workman rate special. You know, they're bringing in Sheeta. As great as Britt Baker is, Sheeta's better. And this was supposed to be a, a you know, a Matt Classic, as they say. And it just wasn't. I would, I would, they was needed to just bring in Rio. They needed to bring in Rio and have her beat Rio for the TBS title. Because Rio, Rio, yeah, Rio's had amazing matches with Nyla Rose. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I'll just I will I won't say my what my thought was. I'm Rio Rio. I'm just I'm not sure on that. I I kind of get what you're going with it, but I'm not sure if that's exactly the way to go. Um, TK probably thought that the crowd would love this match and not the Willow and Chris Statlander match, and that's probably why they're positioned on this card the way that they are. The problem is Willow and Chris, you know, brought the house down to a certain degree. This did not, and not even close to doing so. I'm willing to concede, at least in the AEW portion of Mercedes Monet's career, back-to-back matches, neither one of them have been very good. I will concede that. However, I can't sit here and forget about what we've seen before. So... I get what you're saying, Bill. I do. But I can't say that she is a bad wrestler because if she was, we wouldn't be talking about her. She wouldn't be at this point. She wouldn't be getting paid the money that she's getting paid. She got her contract and then, you know, she James Harden did. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you ain't shit. Taking some time off. She is stealing from Tony Khan. <laughs> you ain't shit. Um, so next we had, um, a match that I feel over delivered, um, and maybe it was because of my feelings about the previous match, but I was like, okay, now we're back in the money here. Once I saw this, uh, so Brian Danielson versus, uh, Jack Perry, um, which first of all, like, am I supposed to believe that Jack Perry drives across the country in the same minibus that I used to try to finger girls in eighth grade? <laughs> He's heating up. <laughs> hey, man. Let that man really? live. Hey, man. He the scapegoat, dog. <laughs> hey, hey. He the scapegoat. Yeah, he grew up a millionaire. <laughs> He's driving around a spray painted minibus. Hey, man. He, he, he ain't living off his daddy's money. He the scapegoat, dog. Okay? Let that man live the character. The fuck's wrong anyway, with you? <laughs> this, this match was a lot of fun. Um, like, this was, uh, I mean, it's a Brian Danielson match, but uh, Jack Perry uh, was doing really good character work. Uh, Jack Perry's a good wrestler. Uh, they had a really hard-hitting match, and uh, I really loved the finish with the Raven pose where, you know, there was a couple of really tight near falls there. Um, he sold the psycho knee better than Ooh. pretty much anybody except Will Ospreay, maybe. Um just because Will Ospreay and him had that one where they hit in the middle of the ring, and it was just like the coolest thing I've ever fucking seen in my life. That was some uh, video game shit right there. <laughs> yeah, but other than that, Jack Perry really sold the fucking second knee, and to finish with him with his arms splayed out like in a Christ-like pose, um, just basically like, give me one more. It was just like Raven in ECW. It was mm-hmm. so cool. Uh, and Danielson hit him with the one more and got him with the one, two, three. The match was awesome. The angle afterwards, Wolf. just over the top crazy. Didn't see that uh, one mean, coming. Well, actually, I did, did not see that one coming. I won't, I won't say that. I won't say that. Moxley being very coy the last few weeks felt like a heel turn was coming. I'll say that. Yes. This wasn't what I was like. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, to give the rundown, yeah, to give the rundown, this is not what I expected at all. To give the rundown, so Danielson just had a battle. Christian Cage's music hits. Uh, he comes mm. down with a whole entourage. Yeah, we said, yeah, so I was saying, let's not bury the lead. And I was like, oh shit. I was like, this is happening. This is cool. And even if it's not, it's a reminder that he's got this at any time. And then Moxley steps out. Uh, he's in his um, 
V-neck phase, uh, the the white tee V-neck. I had the same thing when I was a junior in high school. I was V-neck white tee was all I wore. I get it, um, but uh, you know, just took Moxley in his late thirties. But uh, so uh, he comes out, stands in front, and then Claudio, you know, Wheeler's pack. Everybody else joins. They stay in the front. They're a united front. Daniels is laughing in the ring. So they turn turn the heels away. Big victory celebration. And you could almost tell the way Moxley was acting that something was up. Like, I was like, oh, shit. I was like, this is the moment when Moxley is going to turn because, like you said, he had been acting kind of strange. But Claudio was the one to initiate with the European uppercut. And Danielson's, like, shocked look on his face. And then Moxley pulls out a freaking plastic bag and wraps it over the top of his head like he's in the, the rock star like video game manhunt mm. from like 2003 or four. Um, Deep cut. Just wild shit. And uh, Pat Glenn grabs Wheeler Yuta and holds him back. So there's a lot going on here because Wheeler is still, he's distraught. He was not in on this whole situation. And I felt really bad for him for like the rest of the night until I realized that he's going to have like two Christmases. So he's going to be okay. But, um, <laughs> God damn, you ain't shit. <laughs> uh, this was like a wild angle. Anyway, I've been talking for a long time, so you guys, you guys go ahead. Uh, the match was good. Uh, you know, <laughs> embarrassment of riches. It was really good, but this was all about the angle. I mean, um, the reason that it was a Jack, the reason that he fought Jack Perry was because it really didn't matter who he fought. He had to fight a cream puff that nobody believed would win, so that they could get to the Moxley, uh, really the Mo- the Moxley turn. But yeah, the Claudio turn too. Um, I kind of thought as soon as Moxley came out there to back Christian away, I was like, yeah, I was like, I think I think it's gonna happen right here. Um, you know. It was. It wasn't the first attempt. At, it was. It wasn't the last attempt at murder that we'll see uh, on the pay per view card. But Very it was good. certainly. Um, it was. Uh, it was. A, it was a visual. Yes, very much so. This uh, was uh, some horror movie type shit. <laughs> I did not see coming. Um, just quick to tip of the hat to Jack Perry. All all bullshit aside, you know. The post-match shit, obviously, is something to talk about, but I definitely wanted to tip the hat to Jack Perry. Um, very few guys can uh, can keep up with Daniel uh, Brian, or the, Brian Danielson when it comes to Matt technical wrestling. I'm not saying he kept up with him, but he definitely made Danielson look good, and in turn, Danielson made Jack Perry look good. So I don't want to forget about Jack Perry and all this, even though this was one of those matches where you knew he wasn't going to win. Obviously, the post-match angle is is what we're talking about here. For me, didn't see it coming. This, as soon as he, uh, Claudio hits Danielson, I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm, I'm just processing it. The next thing you know, Moxley is holding. You got uh, Danielson killing him in the ring. I'm watching Will you are crying over here in the corner. I felt, like, I felt bad for little brother, too. So, I mean, the whole angle... Worked. Forged in trauma. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the whole angle worked in that scenario because for whatever reason, we're all invested in the Blackpool Combat Club and now seeing them turn on one of their founding members was a shock to us all in some form or fashion. You know what I'm saying? You, Bill said you saw it coming. Okay, I ain't mad at you for it. Far, you know, far from it. Well, certainly when Moxley kissed his forehead, I was like, ah. Oh. That's that's it. It's it's Godfather. Done now. Yeah, I was about to say Godfather two type shit. So yeah, uh, probably should have seen it coming at that point. I was just more of like you know, okay, yay, you know, Blackpool Combat Club is back together again. But doing it this way kind of makes more sense if you want to keep the Blackpool Combat Club name with this new incarnation. So be it. You just ousting Daniel Bryan. Otherwise, um, now things make more sense. Cardio and Pack on the same page. Pat coming out on oh, Dynamite on Wednesday. They are speaking to his piece. It makes more sense Pat, now. Pat, Claudio, and Yuta are currently uh, right. trios champions. Um, so that shows you, you know, sometimes they tell a story with that, but they, they barely even brought it up even on uh, Wednesday night. Can we talk about Moxley's promo to open up the show Wednesday night that was cut in the parking lot after the turn? Holy Fantastic. shit. I think, Promo of the year? I think if, I think Moxley, like, I mean, people talk about, like, 
MJF is a promo. He's got he's got a thing. Yes, MJF can talk. Like John Moxley might be like the greatest promo I've ever seen in my life, though. I mean, he's some, always some so t- good. Sometimes he cuts a promo. It's like fuck, man. And he's been cutting. And I know I always say it. He's been cutting babyface promos for a long fucking time, man. And he really like it's it's surprising how little time he spends as a heel. And even when he's a heel, it's hard for him to get booed. But he is straight heel here. And it's going to be hard for him to get booed when he's cutting promos saying that the wheels of history are only moved by blood and diplomacy has failed and he's quoting Mussolini and shit like that. <laughs> like, like that. And his delivery when he was talking about William Regal and when he cracked that smile when he said Our, his lordship used to call Brian Danielson the perfect wrestler and he cracked that smile, like, I rewound it. Like, I got chills. I was like, fuck, this is believable shit. It was so good because it all, it it talks about all Blackpool Combat Club and not even saying we, William Regal's name. When he said his lordship, I, I kind of, you know, st- stood up in my chair. I was like, like oh, our, shit. Our mentor, and then he called him his lordship. I was like, like, oh, shit, this is coming full circle. So now that just, that really started to get me more invested. That was it. That was a home run promo I mean, I from Moxley. But I, I mean, honestly, what do you expect, I, honestly? I, 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 it, was, it wasn't very long, um, and it was not in front of the crowd. But, it, like, I have a hard time not – I mean, that's going to be the promo – for me right now, for this year, that's the promo that stands out the most. Recency bias aside, it was fucking awesome. No, it was it was really yeah. good. And basically, it left me like, oh, shit, you know, somebody's getting ready to get that ass whooped tonight after the Moxley promo to open up Dynamite. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see where this goes. <laughs> I would be lying if I said otherwise. He's, like, legit a scary dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> cuck chair aside, that motherfucker That's is- what makes the cuck... That's why the cuck chair <laughs> joke works so well, is because Moxley would be the scariest dude to have sitting in the cuck chair. He really would. Um, <laughs> he absolutely would. Uh, I highly recommend his book. Um, it is fantastic. I highly recommend getting it as an audiobook and just having him read it to you because it's... John Moxley reading his autobiography. Um, it's it's the best wrestling book I've read by a long shot. Um, uh, that and he, and that he sounds like himself. that. I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna, yeah. put, I'm gonna put, I'm it on, put it on your list. Put it on my list. That sounds like a fuck. Yeah. Do they have it on Libby? Nice. Look at it's you. On, yeah, it was on my Libby. I got it from the library. It took a while, but uh, also pro tip: uh, if your library doesn't have something, just request it. They'll buy it for you so that you can enjoy it. That's the beauty of socialism, guys. Um, anyway. Hell yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, very good stuff. So he also, he's been challenging. He's, he's where he's been calling out Darby Allen, and he calls him out on Dynamite, and it is, you know, people were wondering, like, is he going to be a stable? Is he going to try to fight him? Um, but I kind of was thinking, that I'm like, he wants that title shot that Darby had. Uh, and so they're going to be wrestling at Grand Slam, for the title shot, which is shaping up to be a fantastic card. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we got Darby Allen versus John Moxley for a title shot against Brian Nielsen, um, or, you know, whoever's going to be champion, that's going to be Brian Nielsen. Um, and uh, I can see that going either way. I think it's Moxley. I think Moxley wins it. You think Moxley think will pivot? You think Moxley is going to take the title off of Danielson? No, no, take I think, the title, I think title take chance. The title shot. Oh yes, I I I think that also. Can't see Darby Allen winning that one, but I do want to watch the match. But it could go. It really could go either way. I mean, Darby Allen, you know, the fact that I'm an underdog guy. Yeah, the fact that I hesitated just makes me reinforces that I feel like it could. If Darby won, it wouldn't be the biggest surprise I've seen in 2024, but. If it's not Moxley, then you know what? What are we doing? You, he just attacked Danielson. I mean, this, this kind of yeah, makes sense. I know. It's yeah, a, it's a bigger match, and they they did the setup. So uh, Darby will be fun, and Darby could get a match by just Danielson being like, "Hey, sorry, you lost that match. Uh, I'll give you a match tonight on Dynamite." And then they just do a match. Like, I mean, because he can do that to be a bro. Definitely um, ways around it. Yeah, uh, but uh, yes, um, and that's a way for Dave, for uh, 
Moxley to earn a shot, um, you know, right away. So uh, I think that's likely. Uh, Nigel McGinnis getting a shot uh, at Grand Slam. So that's shaping up to be uh, like Grand Slam. We have Nigel McGinnis versus Brian Danielson for the AEW world title. We got John Moxley versus Darby Allen for a shot at that title. And then we've got Young Bucks versus Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher, uh, which will probably be the tag team match of the year. <laughs> and that's, well, yeah, it's got Osprey. And that is, that's on television. Yes. That's just a dynamite. <laughs> Fucking. Arthur Ashe Stadium. So it's a stadium show. Um, Embarrassment of riches. Yeah, that that should be uh, off the fucking chain. And I'm glad that Nigel McGinnis and Danielson is going to happen. I mean, if if you're going to do that, do it now. While the the striking when the iron's hot, we always talk about it. Nigel McGinnis has still kind of got that buzz coming off of talk about long term storytelling. Full show, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Nigel's been angling for this match since he started commentary. I mean, to tell you, man, all bullshit aside, he has been waiting for this moment. I'm hyped for that match. I cannot wait. (laughs) Nigel McGinnis is like, I prayed to this. Mm. Um, (laughs) So uh, then we had the lights out match uh, Adam Page versus Swerve Strickland. Um, this thing started out crazy and just got crazier. It started out with them grappling and seeing who could hold the other person's head underneath the cage as it lowers, because apparently everyone on the AEW production team, including Tony Khan, are just bloodthirsty maniac killers, and they just want to see someone's head smushed, and they are not going to stop this cage no matter if somebody's head is underneath it or not. <laughs> you can see them fighting in fun. the back, like, get away from that! <laughs> get away from that! <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, my wife's blueberries, you might get decapitated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a possibility. This is a possibility. Uh, Go too far. Very early, very early on, pulled out a staple gun uh, and, um, you know, started to, you know, do the staples in the swerve's chest. You know, he's laughing it off. Um, they do the staple gun back and forth. Swerve staples a family photo uh, to hit Adam Page uh, his chest. Then he staples one to his face and rips it off. Um, this is really just—it's a bloodthirsty match, and they, they they played it off very well because they're just out to hurt each other. Um, there's barbed wire being wrapped around the cage. Um, Page realized realizes too late that he cannot do the buckshot lariat uh, off of the ropes because the, the cage is in the way. Um, so he ends up doing, uh, I think actually swerved as a buckshot lariat off the referee's back uh, <laughs> on the page at one point. Um, Swerve pulls out a cinder block. Uh, he does uh, the, Dude, I, I forget that move, what it's called. The cinder block spots Mm-mm. are, Mm-mm. were, just absolutely insane man. like the like you can talk about, we're gonna get to the syringe in a little bit and if you didn't watch this and you don't know what happened that's right i didn't stutter and i didn't misspeak we'll nope. get to the syringe in a little bit but the the backbreakers are the power bombs straight onto the fucking cinder block i mean can't gimmick a cinder block uh the chairs were gimmicked no. uh you can't gimmick a cha- cinder block and when Swerve just pulled that motherfucker in there and dropped it on there, and it goes, boom, it's like, oh, oh shit. Fuck. And uh, that's yeah. probably the most that you can do with a cinder block without killing somebody. Um, yeah. I forgot what the, what the move's called, but he had him, like, upside down, and he dropped him. He the, dropped Paige, like, on eye. the corner oh, yeah, of the, the cinder eye. block. But it wasn't a dead eye. It was, he had him, like, uh, he had his, like, they were back-to-back, um, I can't remember. Anyway. The the dead eye uh, is the thing where he does like a pile driver around the back. Yeah, but it wasn't a dead eye. It was not a dead eye. They were back to back and he was facing the other way. But um, but yeah, he dropped him on the corner. And I mean, like, like Rick Reed broke his back in a very similar spot. Uh, But you can immediately see Paige, like blood just welling up because that cinder block just scraped all the way down Paige's Mm -hmm. spine. Um, And then... Page power bombs were later. Not only did he power bomb him right onto the cinder block, so like the small of his back was right on top of the cinder block. He power bombed him from the top rope. Thankfully, that was not on the cinder block, but it was still like a top rope power bomb. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, there was just back and forth, like house calls and just everything um, until finally. Oh, and then he also pulled out like a piece of burnt wood. Uh, it was just basically a stake, like a wooden stake. And there was some stabbing. There was some back and forth about you know, trying to stab people's eyes out. That um, also there was some looked, actual stabbing. That was rough looking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? This, this, this match to me, you know, it reminded me a lot of uh, Schindler's List. And in to say <laughs> that it was well done, it was powerful, it was emotionally draining, and it was very unpleasant to watch. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, to say that th- you can say this match was good, I can't say I liked it the match it's not my type of match i'm not one of those babies that's on twitter screaming about how dangerous it is listen these are professionals uh you know they are working as safe as possible i kept thinking that during the match i was like man these guys must fucking love each other like because you really gotta trust trust each other Mm -hmm. i mean you really gotta trust a guy to allow him to to allow another grown man to do what they were doing to each other in that ring so um you know, it was uh, – I don't know how they're going to – you know, Swerve looks like he's going away for a while, too. He needs to. Was there anything in the syringe? Yeah. So, uh, I don't think so. At first, like, so and he pulls Swerve's grill out. He first pulls Swerve's grill out, and then he grabs the syringe, and I was like, holy shit. I was like, is he going to, like, pull out his fucking real teeth? Like, is he going to fucking pull out a tooth? That's what I was uh, thinking was like, going to happen. I'm like, something. this is getting wild. I would have passed out. <laughs> but he uh, – he shoves the hypodermic needle like through his cheek, uh, and then he he takes a steel chair, slams it on top of his head, and it's a KO. And um, you know, the the best part about this match was the very 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 end where Adam Page just can't even believe what he's done, and he's standing at the top of the ramp, and he starts to go back. And I think the crowd, who was like, you know, I think the crowd thought that he was going back because he wanted more, like he was like bloodthirsty but i think in that moment like storytelling wise he had realized what he had become and that he had finally done the thing that he had wanted to do and he realized what he had done to another human being and he was kind of going back to check on him but he stops himself and once he stops himself dude like the ending image of hangman page screaming with his eyes wide open and his hair is all crazy and he's bloody and he drops to his knees and he's just screaming was fucking wild. Like this was a man. It was like a burner hose on film. Like it was just, <laughs> it was so cool. Yeah. yeah. It was art. It was cherry on top of the cake, man. This is my match. It was art. I'm sorry. I, and I'll, I'll go this far. I'm not a death match guy. There's for me, there's lines for wrestling. That's my line, death match. This was bordering on that line when then that, that hyperdurant needle came out. Um, minus that, I mean, the cinder block, obviously, you know, that was a, a really rough, rough-looking spot. You know, like I said, for me, in kayfabe style, uh, Swerve shouldn't be coming back for a while. Wrestle Dream should be the next time we see Swerve physically in the ring if you want to keep him uh off story, uh, off TV for a while. That would make perfect sense, especially in a match such as this. For me, this was the culmination of a months-long feud that finally feels like this is going to be the blow-off for a moment. And the, finally, it, it can go. It goes both ways. Page winning gives him vindication in his mind because now he's fucking. You know, he stomped out Swerve, but. In the world of AEW, this match never really happened. So if you want to play that card, you can play that card at a later date, too. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Um, I wasn't here last week to talk about those two pay-per-views, but I'll just read the scores off real fast. Um, (laughs) Was I the only one that picked Swerve? I don't remember. Uh, Yes, from that. I picked Paige. Did you pick Paige? From From All Out? Yeah. Yes. So uh, currently, I am in the lead with 166. Uh, Jason, Actually, take that back. You're, I gave you that point. You're, you have nine points from that. Oh well, I'm still in first place with 165 points. Uh, coming in second, we have Jason Cornelius Bell with 165 points, and uh, 
Zach <laughs> Zach had a had a rough NXT. Um, what was that called? No Mercy. Oh, I, I think I got them all wrong. No, you had Obafemi, you had Kalani Jordan, you had Roxanne, but you missed Chase U, you missed Wesley, and you missed Joe Hendry. Joe Hendry, uh, you know, to be fair to you, was a ballsy pick, and we appreciate ballsy picks here, but you are bringing up the rear with 161, so you're four back from me and Jason. Um, so, grade for All Out? A minus. A minus. Yeah, yeah. I was I was thinking B plus, but I was leaning A minus. So I want to go with A minus. A minus is all around. Uh, Zach, we already talked about dynamite a bunch, so we might as well just knock it out here. Yeah, uh, there's nothing to add. Right? There, there was other stuff, but I don't think we need this to later the point. We got highlights. Um. Yeah, I liked it when uh, Christian Cage said he wished that Brie Bella had CTE. <laughs> that, was, that was a good line. God damn. I'm uh, like, man, this nigga ain't shit. Mox man, is, fuck you. Mox's promo. Uh, we talked about um, Learning Tree, I guess, are going after. Oh, here's what I want to talk about. I don't know. Uh, you guys, please bring up anything that you want to about Dynamite. But I go away for one week, and now the Outrunners are over? They won their first match on uh, Collision. And then on Rampage to open up Rampage, they were backstage celebrating their first win in AEW, and Marina Shafir and Moxley beat them down backstage. Yeah, but when they came out for the gauntlet match, they got a huge pop. They're they're, they're that, super over. Yeah, they're they're that over uh, chopper tag team. Oh, I love that. There's a new what'd you just say? Yeah, they're like a tag team that like is kind of like underdogs, and the crowd just is like, you know what? We're gonna throw our support behind these guys. Okay, yeah. What, what, hang on, man. Would you say three beer? <laughs> no, nah, nah, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> what you say? Oh yeah, they're over. I'm buying a t-shirt. I got, I got, I got one on the way. Oh okay. Fuck, yes. I thought you said something about the acclaim. I'm like, damn, he man. Did. He <laughs> said they're the new acclaim. <laughs> say fuck you. Yeah. That's, no, but that's yeah. what that's what he's saying though. Is that they're the baby a face. mediocre tag team, undeserved of big yeah. screen <laughs> Okay, see, that's what I was waiting for. <laughs> Turbo Floyd and Truth Magnum. I love Jeez. them. I love them. <laughs> Good them stuff. and Iron Savages. <laughs> Roll them out That's every week. Than Max Caster and Anthony Bowen. Okay, man. All right. All right, man. All right. You need to stop. <laughs> they don't rap. <laughs> Casino Gauntlet match. We could talk about that. For, and this is... I would love, and this is well, kind Will of... Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher being number one contenders is big. It kind of is. It, it is what it is. You know, for me... It is what it is. It's going to be it's, a fucking It's going to be a great match. match. It's going to be a great match. I'm not saying that it's not going to be a great match. You know how I am about my tag teams. I wish they would just be a tag team. This feels like a makeshift tag team because why? It is a makeshift tag team. I wish they wouldn't have won, but they won. It's going to be a really fun match to watch. However, my point is this. We could have done this in over two or three weeks' time, build up some stories outside of uh, GYV and F FTR, and then, you know, you got some depth going. That's all I was going to say. Yeah, I got nothing else about that um, except for – nope, we already talked about it. Okay, let's get to that to count. JCB, what's the two count? Two count. We're going to talk on some WWE. Uh, we're going to go over to SmackDown. SmackDown opens up with Cody Rhodes uh, returning back to the States as obviously your WWE Universal Champion. Calling, well, not calling out, but obviously Solo Sokoa and the Bloodline coming out. Solo is demanding he's going to be next in line. But Cody Rose throws us a changeup, I guess, would be the, the pitch we're talking about this week. This week's changeup, he wants Jacob Fatu instead of Soa Sokoa, which made me kind of perk up my ears like a dog. Like, Roof? I'm like, oh, shit, this is going to happen. So I'm immediately invested. Unfortunately for 
most of us involved. So is Sokoa. He has Jacob Fatu under his thumb for a moment. Even though you did see a little hesitation from Jacob Fatu, I don't want to say that there's dissension early in the bloodline, but there was a little hesitation before Jacob Fatu reneged on that promise. I wouldn't say reneged, but gave the title shot back to Sola Sokoa. So now we're going to have Sola Sokoa versus Cody Rhodes in a steel cage match tomorrow night on SmackDown down for the WWE Universal Championship. I thought this was one of the better segments of Cody versus this new Bloodline O or Bloodline 2.0. Uh, I know this new version that isn't as hot as the old one is, but for me, this segment got me invested just for the fact that Cody called out somebody that I didn't think he was going to call out and made me at least think this could be down the line. Ultimately, I think this is all a holding pattern for The Rock, but we can talk about that if you want to. Uh, the worst thing that ever happened to Solo Sokoa was Jacob Fatu uh, coming into the company because Jacob Fatu is like a better version of Solo Sokoa. I don't, Ouch. I don't, I, man, Whoa. I, I got to call it like I see it. It was uh, Friday night. I was uh, My wife had fallen asleep. We just got done uh, doing a puzzle. I was having a good time. Um, and, uh, Holla. I was seeing it as though it was for the first time. And I was like, man, Jacob fat too, just has so much more charisma. He's more exciting. He's a better wrestler and you know, they're both in the bloodline. So they're both around the same age. And maybe it's just cause maybe I'm tiring a little bit on Solo Sokoa and the fresh blood in there is good fresh blood it's a guy that i was unfamiliar with and i'm just it just seemed like the right thing for cody to say it made it made all the sense in the world that uh jaga fat too uh, will soon eclipse solo sokoa on the card at least in terms of stature in my opinion three beer i i agree with everything you just said like 100 i didn't get to see this segment uh hulu uh went to like for SmackDown, you have to like subscribe to their premium shit for SmackDown now. Oh I guess maybe it's the, the swap to USA. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Um, and uh, but so I didn't get to see any of SmackDown. If it keeps up, I'm gonna have to like find another way to watch it. But um, you can watch yeah. it on any of those pirate channels. Yeah, that's what I mean. I'll just find another way. But I usually like watching watching on Hulu in the background on my big TV. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Jacob Fatu is such a <laughs> Jacob Fatu is such a more exciting opponent. But the Solo Sokoa cage match is going to pop a rating for the first SmackDown in USA, so good for them. Something with yeah, the quick sidebar. Obviously, SmackDown going to USA starting to, tomorrow night. Um, Fox, I'm sorry, not Fox. There's but no way Roman doesn't come back tomorrow night, right? I would be a little surprised if we didn't see Roman Reigns in some form or fashion. I'd be surprised if we didn't see The Rock. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking The Rock might come too. I, I'm waiting. Rock feels more like Royal Rumble-ish time. WrestleMania uh, season already. Yeah. <laughs> we just see the fucking Undertaker. You know, they're trying to pop race. Um Raw going to two hours uh, starting. Now, that is huge. That's news. a big deal. Um I'm really interested to see how Raw is going to be shown in a two-hour block when we're so used to being – we've we've been programmed for three for so it's, long. It's going to be good. Yeah, no, it's especially it's be better. I mean, in, in, in this Triple H era, I think it's going to be – just it's going to be just as good as SmackDown is now, probably even better because of some of the people that are on Raw – I like a little more than the sum of people that I like is, on SmackDown. That is legit great news. Like it's gonna it's only for three months though. Yeah, until they get to Netflix, right? Yeah, they'll yeah, probably go back so to three at that a, point. Well, then it'll be it'll will. be untimed, right? I mean, like yeah, they, if they, they, they wanted to go longer, they could. And then right. Yeah. Obviously, you know, the content would be would probably be a little different, but right. So, um, it's uh. Them going to two hours, I mean, Raw is so much recap and so much filler. Uh, it'll just, it, it'll tighten it up. It'll make it less laborious to watch it every week. And so I, I'm obviously two thumbs up from this guy. 
I don't think Raw is nearly the labor of love as it once was. Three hours is a lot. I will concede that. There's no doubt it's better. I'm just saying yeah. three hours. There's still a bunch of matches that don't mean anything. Maybe now. I, I can agree with that. Right now, I maybe mean, not, but maybe down the line they will. I'm willing to give Triple H to doubt. Have fun on main event, Pure Fusion Collective. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Nia Jackson, Tiffany Stratton backstage. I don't know why I'm talking shit to them. I, I like them all. Uh, Nia Jackson uh, questioning Tiffany Stratton backstage about last week's uh, possible cash in. Um, Tiffany denies it, claims, puts the blame on Chelsea Green, which leads into the Bailey versus Tiffany Stratton match. Obviously, Bailey goes over. Um, I guess this is the curse of the money in the bank coming into play. Uh, part of me did want Tiffany Stratton to win, but I guess Bailey does have to get a rematch at some point. So I guess this is the route we're going with it. Bailey winning, not the biggest deal in the world. Um, KO and A Town down under backstage. That leads into a match of a, actually a, a triple threat match where KO defeats uh, A Town down under, even though it was a triple threat match. Um, once again, more teasing of an Austin Theory. Grayson Waller split goes snuffs away pretty quickly as they both attack KO post match. Any thoughts on either or match? Uh, I don't Do you think Go ahead, Zach. Austin Theory and Grayson Waller will break up before the world runs out of water or not? Not at this point, no. <laughs> I'm going to say no. No, I think that yeah. I think they're in it for the long run. When run. is this going to happen? It's just when uh, WrestleMania fifty seven. I was kind of hoping for a little bit more of a serious KO coming out of the uh, match with Cody. Um, like I said, I didn't watch it the week before, but uh, I, I, I don't know. This was all right. I like all three guys. Um, well, Gal Del Fantasma with a another backstage or a vignette or whatever. Um, still waiting for them to to make me even care about them at a certain point. I like Santos, but Santos losing the LA night now feels like what's next for them. We'll, we'll see in a little bit. And the shocker of the week, I would say, Giovanni Vinci returns to SmackDown and quickly loses to Apollo Crews via roll-up within 30 seconds, probably less than that. Um, I'm not sure what the hell this means for Giovanni Vinci, but I will say this. A, was I pissed? Yep. B, I need to see some sort of reason why we did this because doing this is a signal for something. I don't know what Giovanni Vinci did backstage. We did anything at all. We're getting rolled up by a power cruise that has been ice, ice cold for a long time. I mean, he's been losing with Baron Corbin for weeks, and now all of a sudden he coming off the side of the milk carton on the singles match and rolls up Giovanni Vinci, who you've been pushing for three weeks? Make it make sense, dog. Uh, well, you know, yes. like 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 you always say, Jason. We gotta wait to see what happens next. Uh, was Shit. I surprised? Yes. Was I pissed off? No, because no, I was pissed. Th- I mean, this means one of two things. They're pulling the plug on it. Well, I guess it means one of three things. A, they're pulling the plug on it. B, he's just gonna be bottom of the card comedy fodder, loses all the time. Uh, which I don't think would be a terrible role for a character like this. Like that. You can have that at the bottom of the card. Like, we don't have to push everybody to the fucking moon. Or the third option is they're going to tell a story um, with this somehow and spin it into gold. Um, I'm not holding my breath for that one. Actually, I kind of, I'm kind of rooting for option B. Yeah. You're not eventually wondering why he lost his match in this fashion to that opponent is, like, the same reason... I would wonder why the hot waitress gave me her number and told me she was getting off in 15 minutes. And I was just like, oh, cool. Good for you. Right. Long day. And I just walk out the door. <laughs> like, bro, you're fucking dull. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> you stupid as hell. 
Chelsea Green and beat you beef backstage, which leads into a match. Chelsea Green with the uh, I would I'm going to say a surprising win. How about pleasantly surprised Chelsea Green uh, gets the dub. It probably leads into what happens from uh, leading into NXT, building her up for the NXT uh, match against Julia. I'm sure we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, Mel Andrade have a vignette, which leads into L.A. Knight, Melo, and Andrade all into the ring. Basically, Melo and Andrade beefing with two wins apiece. Feels like the winner is ultimately going to be led to L.A. Knight. So I'll ask the question, which match would you rather see? L.A. Knight versus Andrade or L.A. Knight versus Carmelo Hayes? Carmelo Hayes. Um, an L.A. Knight match uh, is more about uh, the uh, – well, I, I I shouldn't say this, but it, you know, I, there can be more character stuff, and Carmelo Hayes is a better character. I will agree um, for the exact same reasons. Although, um, yeah, and also you know, Ali Knight not particularly like well known to be like a ring general, but he's been a long time veteran, been doing it for longer than Carmelo Hayes. Um, I think there's more benefit to Carmelo working with another veteran that's not Andrade. Although I think these the reps that he's getting with Andrade are great. I will say I must be the uh, the rider of the fence on this one. If you want to have a straight, really good match, I would say Andrade. If you want to make this a an angle, a feud, I would go with Carmelo. Carmelo could carry the mic with. L.A. Knight, especially in a WWE setting where you have to be able to talk and talk well. Andrade, God bless him, he can only go so far. L.A. Knight can hold the stick with any of the any of the best of them in WWE, so I'll, I'll go that route. That's just me. All right. Um, Bianca and Jade, Isla Dawn, and Alba Fire, uh, Vignette. It is what it is. DIY and the Street Profits backstage before their main event, eight-man tag. Uh, not necessarily on the same page, but they both all agree that the bloodline has to go down, which leads into the main event, bloodline versus DIY and the Street Profits. Um, bloodline gets the dub. I thought this was important for them to get the dub. But I will say this. I thought what they did on NXT outshined what they did here on SmackDown, if that makes sense. Who, the Street Profits? No. Um, oh, what, the Bloodline? Bloodline, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't really pay attention to this. I was paying attention to NXT when that happened, though, and the Bloodline invading NXT is a big deal and a pretty cool moment. No, the way they did it, it was just like, oh, shit, what the fuck is this? This felt like more of a foregone conclusion leading to the Cody, Solo Sokol, and match tomorrow night. Yeah. Bloodline, you know, just jumping out of nowhere. This was as, you know, as dangerous, quote unquote, as the Bloodline 2.0 has felt in a while. And I think that that's kind of at least a part of the reason So is Sokoa being the head of the uh, the table, so to speak, might be another part of the reason uh, that this new Bloodline is not necessarily as hot. But – I like the fact that they did come out on NXT and just destroy everybody in their path. That makes them feel more dangerous again. It's your count? Yeah, I didn't get to see. I was super, oh. super busy with uh, work. I didn't get to see uh, the NXT stuff, but it um, seems like they're gearing up for a network switch as well. So there'll probably be a lot more of these main roster guys uh, for their CW switch. No doubt. Yeah. I don't mind it just kind of, you know, rotating, you know, talent back and forth through all three brands, so to speak. As long as it makes sense, knock yourself out. Make it make Makes sense. sense. Oh, Raw opens, speaking of make it make sense, Raw opens up <laughs> on Monday night with an eight-man, eight-person mixed tag, the Wyatts versus American Maid. Um I, I thought Uncle Howdy would be a part of this. I'm not sure why I thought this, but neither here nor there. Um, I thought Dexter Loomis was the one person that really stood out. He's awesome. In all this. Um, and this was, to me, it was a, a three-beer uh, party match special with all kinds of crazy shit going on. Um, a little disappointed in the uh, 
the women, there was just not enough between Nikki Cross and Ivy Nile to be for me, even to have them justifiably be in this match. Neither here nor there. I can, I get the why. I just don't think that there was enough of them doing whatever. You know, they were in spots, but just not in it long enough for them to be justifiably into this match. Like I said, for me, Destin Rumor stood out the most. Uh, from that point, it just felt like this was another way to get the Wyatt Six over. So I guess here's the question. Do you look at the Wyatt Six any differently after this? Because if this feels like the blow-off match for them and American Made, obviously the Wyatt Six goes over. Are you looking forward to what's next for them, or did we just spin our wheels with this? Zach, I'll let you go first. I mean, they're just part of the show now. I'm not expecting anything special or revolutionary or anything. I feel like Bray was always trying to, like, maybe take the character and take something to the next level instead of maybe just, uh, you know, it was always kind of fourth fourth wall, and he was really just trying to, uh, I don't know, improve on existing formulas and things like that. Uh, This seems, you know, maybe like they're just going to execute using those characters in pre-existing pro wrestling, uh, which is like totally fine. Um, But yeah, for me, they're just part of the show. They are neither an attraction nor a detraction. If they do too much spooky stuff, it will be a detraction, but I'm fine with them as part of the show. Yeah, I mean, Zach and I are in Sapatico tonight. That it's part of the show now. It's like it's fine when they're on. I don't hate them, but uh, there hasn't been any development in a few weeks now. Um, so I tell you what, it's time for Chad Gable and the Creeds to do something different. I I couldn't agree more. I, I'm been praying for this feud to end because I have high hopes for American Made. Whether it's the Creeds being tag team champions, Chad Gable finally getting a singles title run of some sort. I get it. You want to get the Wyatts over. Okay. Time to move on. Time to get American Made established. Ivy now included the whole nine yards. It is a bewildering feud. It, it's it's at the point now where I'm just like, okay, I'm I'm over it. I'm ready for both sides to move on. Wherever you guys got to go. Bang, bang, scissor, Wyatt six, American Made gang <laughs> <laughs> i thought you was gonna try to sneak one more in there now that was still good i was say i like the throwbacks guys i like the throwbacks finn balor and damian priest have a uh segment in the ring damian priest uh still obviously pissed at finn balor i love finn balor kind of giving more of the reason why you know you made me feel like a sidekick finn balor ain't no sidekick i was like okay see now we're talking Finn wants Damian Priest at Bad Blood. I'm assuming that's going to be a match if it hasn't if it hasn't already it's been official. made. Okay, there you go. Adam Pierce just said it. It made it official. Damian Priest, Finn Balor at Bad Blood. I'm kind of intrigued to see how this works. I'm sure that this will be all kinds of fuckery, but just the nuts and bolts in the match. I think Finn and Damian Priest both good in the ring. I think this should be a good match. Braun Breaker and Braun Strowman backstage. Uh, Braun Breaker just intimidating motherfuckers everywhere you go, walking up to know everybody, not giving a fuck, told Braun, Braun Strowman he will bounce him around if he gets the chance to do so. Um, Jade and Bianca retain against Alba Fire and Isla Dawn. This, these, look, I'm not saying these two need to go away, but it's time to get somebody else new in front of Jade and Bianca. At least that's one person's opinion. Speaking of something new, um, LWO and Judgment Day again backstage. I love, I do love Ray and Dom beefing, but I don't want to see LWO and Judgment Day around it. Just let's focus on these two. Dom and Ray make me interested. I'm not interested in the rest of at least the LWO. I do like Judgment Day. I would be lying if I said otherwise. Am I tripping to see? Is this more of the same thing with LWO and Judgment Day? It feels like we've been down this road before. I know we can milk the Ray and Dom Cow again, but it feels like we're milking it for unnecessary reasons. Am I tripping? No, you're not. You don't want to see Carlito versus Elena Vega? <laughs> I was about to say, Shannon Sharp just entered the chat. <laughs> I mean, just this just kind of does uh, doesn't do a lot for me. 
Um, like you said, we've seen it before. I'm, I, Dom's so much more interesting that now that um, him versus Ray wouldn't be the first thing that I want to see. I could agree. I couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree. I was just thinking about Dom the other day. I would be. He's what such about a, Uncle Howdy being mad that he's kissing on his fucking wife. Her girlfriend. You know, she wait, is them. Bo Dallas and Liv Morgan together? They've been together for a long time. Oh hell no! I didn't know that. I didn't man, know that either. Fucking journalist over here, man. Yeah, he's, he's scooping scoop. you. He's scooping he's, you. He scooped me. He's scooping you. <laughs> What's up with that? Uh, yeah, I, I would be a little, you know, perturbed if uh, Dirty Don was uh, snuggled up with my boo boo. But uh, that's why I like Dirty. They Don. should have Liv Morgan join the Wyatt Six, but she thinks she's Alexa Bliss. I just thought about that. I, I, think, <laughs> I thought the exact same thing. Hot take: Dom Mysterio ha- has his own faction in two years. That's ultimately where I was going with this. He'll be leading his own shit. And it's just a harem of bitches. Feeding <laughs> <laughs> uh, them candies. <laughs> I love where your head's at. <laughs> uh, Brett, it's just hit- all those blonde headed gals at NXT that all look and sound the same, and you can't tell them apart. Oh, yeah. There oh, are a no. ton of them. Oh, no. Like Izzy Dame and Carmen <laughs> Petrovich, and fucking, there's the one chick, Carly Bright. There's like five more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. There's the one chick that's exactly like Thea Hale, and it's like, are, is that your thing that you're supposed to be just like Thea Hale? I have to. Th- I didn't think like of that baseball. until you said that. <laughs> like Soul Ruka, God bless her. You know, she's another blind. No, Soul Ruka stands out. She does stand out. I mean, she does. Yeah, yeah. But in that theme of blind women, Soul Ruka definitely can jump into Soul that. Soul Ruka did straighten her hair one week, and I was like, what are you doing? Because now you just look like all the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> Nigga, true story. Brett the Hitman Hart uh, appears on SmackDown being in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And oh, wait. I just want to say that uh, the Finn promo was fantastic. It's fun to have him out there cutting promos again. And I'm looking forward to him versus Priest quite a bit. And Braun Breaker talking to Braun Strowman in the back was fucking awesome. I'm like, whoop uh, his ass, Braun, Braun Baker, Breaker. <laughs> whoop his ass. He's got a hold of his character, man. <laughs> oh, my God. He doesn't give a fuck who it is. I'm going to whoop your ass. I love it. I love it. He better hold on to this title for a hot minute the rest of the year at the bare minimum. Um, Hitman comes out for his segment coming back home to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and Gunther arrives, and I'm thinking to myself, please don't kill this man. D- just don't hurt him but he did hurt him it was just with the words when he said that that Bret Hart was the number two wrestler behind Bill Goldberg I about fell out my goddamn chair it was that was the it was the perfect line for the perfect guy in the perfect moment didn't it, Bret Hart kind of talk shit about Gunther after uh some pay-per-view last year or something I, think I don't that, know. I think that Bret Hart criticized Gunther, so I think there was like a little bit of story there. Um, if if so, even better. <laughs> what you think, Zach? Oh man, this is fantastic stuff. Uh, this is like it's getting it's getting Gunther over even more, and like they didn't make Bret Hart out to look. You know, a lot of times sometimes, and maybe it's just because it was a Vince thing. Vince would try out the legends, not Stone Cold and Rock and those guys, but like he tried out the other legends and they wouldn't look good. Like he would like humiliate them or, you know, have the other wrestlers try to look good by humiliating them. They did not do that with Brett. Or beat him like a legend. at WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, he was he was in on the joke. You know, like Brett, Brett like was corpsing during this. Like he was having a good time. Sammy Zayn obviously comes out to defend Bret Hart, challenges Gunther again. Gunther gives him the Heisman. Um, obviously, I think we're going to get this match probably at Bad Blood, but I don't mind the fact that Gunther is not ready to 
accept the Sami Zayn challenge for obvious reasons. You don't necessarily want to face the guy that has that dub, the one of the few dubs on you if you're Gunther. You don't want to do it right away. This was – Also, he just fucking lost the intercontinental title, like, you know, like, uh, like get in mind, brother. True story, too. True story, um, too. This is the first time I've ever looked – this is the first time I've ever looked at Bret Hart and thought, oh, fuck, he looks fucking old. Mm-hmm. He looked fucking... Like, when they showed him walking backstage, I was like, oh, that's an old man. Yep. You know? Um, I'm glad he still gets out there. He never seems all that comfortable. He did look like he was having a good time out there Monday night, though. He always kind of acts like he doesn't want to be there. Yeah, I feel like he acts like that everywhere he is, though. Yeah, he's a, I mean, heart. Yeah, he's a curmudgeon. Yeah, see, I was getting ready to say, you, you paying me, right? All right, fuck it. I'll show up. Pete uh, <laughs> Dunn, Braun Breaker, I have a, uh, a little beef backstage. No big deal. Obviously, we've talked about Braun Breaker just making the rounds. Um, Dom versus Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee getting the surprising win, but then obviously um, Judgment Day beats them down, beats Dr- Dragon Lee down post match. Um, Lyra. Natty and uh, Selena Vega, Natty returning back to WWE, I'm assuming back under contract and wrestling again. They beat the aforementioned Pure Fusion Collective. Uh, That leads into Drew McIntyre coming out to troll the crowd. But unfortunately, things kind of backfire on Drew as Adam Pearce comes out to announce that he and CM Punk will have one more match at Bad Blood in a Hell in a Cell match. So, obviously, Drew winning at SummerSlam, Punk winning most recently uh, at the last PLE, both sides at one and one apiece. Who do you want to see win? Who do you think will win? Zach, I mean... Drew and Drew. Yeah, I mean, it's Drew and Drew. I'm going Drew and Punk. At some point, I think... Punk's going to be leading towards Gunther. I don't think they just threw that Gunther shit out there just to throw it out there. That's just me. Man, I I would be surprised if McIntyre didn't go over. I would be mad if McIntyre didn't go over. Obviously, wearing the shirt, that would piss me off, but neither here nor there. I would, I'll would. i go this far. If the beefers were today, it would be Gunther and Drew as WWE Russell of the Year for me, and I would still lean Drew. If if um does the winner of the Hell in a Cell match go on to face Gunther next? Is that the way there's you think no, it's going? There's no there's no stake to it. No, I know, but I'm asking you oh. just is that what you think is going to happen? In my in my mind, like I said, when Punk was cutting that promo about wanting Gunther and you know, facing him now, I don't think like I said, I don't think they do Triple H doesn't do this for no reason. They don't just drop nuggets like that. At some point, we I think we could all safely assume that Gunther goes over Sami Zayn. Now what? CM Punk makes sense. Zach, same question. Yeah, I'd say either one of those or um, did, did Gunther wrestle Finn on mm. did they do a raw match? <laughs> This is we talked about this a while back, and they yeah, were going we, to wrestle, and then the pandemic hit, and they didn't wrestle. Yeah, we covered this. They did have a raw match. No, I mean they haven't. Done, yeah, but did they do? They did it on raw. They did it on raw. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because that was like because if Finn beats Priest, I can see Finn getting a match in a in like a similar fashion. But uh, uh, that was this is Priest as the recent champion. That's actually what I I would be rooting for. I would want to see Finn versus Gunther. Two heels though, two heels. Drew two heels, but that, I mean they can yeah. kind of they can kind of play with that. Like they played with it with Gunther and Priest to perfection. They had you know Priest was kind of a tweener, but they had him play more of the baby face. He fought from under during the match, and they had Gunther go heel. Like they can tweak it a little bit. They did that very successfully in that in, scenario in yes. the build up to SummerSlam. So you know they can do it. Fair, completely fair. Um, didn't think it would be like that, but we'll see what happens. I'm once again curious to see what happens. Interested to see how the uh, the Hell and Cell match unfolds. Um, I, I tell you what, I would like to see Drew win it, but if Punk won it, 
I understand if he's going to wrestle Gunther. If he does wrestle Gunther, I would love for Punk to just get the shit beat out of him and then Punk, like, put him over, like, in a promo afterwards and being like, I don't even want to rematch with that dude. Like, uh, good luck to whoever <laughs> goes on and then, like, Punk's going to do something else because, like, Gunther's just, like, such a monster. That'd be pretty fun. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would be surprised if that happened. To be perfect. <laughs> that maybe that's just me. Yeah, it's never gonna happen. No, they say to put him over like that. That's that's just. I was surprised that Randy Orton and uh, Gunther shook hands. I can't, you know, CM Punk, you know, tipping hat like that. I would be very shocked to see that. Um, Orton's pretty old school too. That was a super old school thing for Randy Orton to do. Completely fair. Um, new day backstage. Uh, they're going to get a tag team title match next week against Judgment Day. Um, Odyssey Jones, obviously conspicuous with his absence. Okay, so what happened? What did I miss? Um, apparently, and it's, I'll go with the supposedly part of it because I never really dug into it. Uh, WWE quietly released Odyssey Jones due to some domestic uh, abuse allegations. No shit. And so now Kofi and Xavier Woods are all just, they're just all buddy buddy again. And it's time for the new day to go again, huh? No, uh, there was, uh, Xavier was like, you know, I thought we were going after singles tiles, but, you know, we can go after tag team tiles. They kind of put their own little kayfabe style spin on it and then, you know, moved from there. Well, I'm back to not caring. <laughs> so, okay, so if Xavier Woods turns on Kofi in that tag team match, you still wouldn't care? No, they don't care, I guess. I don't know. I really like the Odyssey Jones thing. They should replace him. Ooh, what who? What's Biggie Langston? Who? They got to have another black guy in NXT. Stop. They got to. <laughs> Y'all think same shit. <laughs> God damn! Or they'll fucking throw Eddie Thorpe up there. Is that? Or that is, be like that? Yo, know, good black man's tit. That motherfucker looks Native American. What's that Chris Rock thing about the uh, Native American parade? He's like, those are two Puerto Ricans at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Ray Mysterio. You can't dress up no Puerto Ricans <laughs> like Indians. <laughs> Chris Rock ain't shit neither. Rey Mysterio wins by disqualification over Finn Balor after Finn Balor refuses to uh, break a hold of uh, the sub- submission move, tearing up Ray's leg, beats down Ray post match after the fact. I, once again, I thought, unfortunately for Ray, good use of for Ray getting beat down by Finn makes him look a little more dangerous leading up to the Damian Priest bad blood match. Um, Ilya and Jay Uso bumping the Braun Breaker. I thought this was to me one of my favorite uh, interactions with Braun Breaker because Jay Uso quietly bumps into them. It doesn't say anything. Nice little eye stare leading into the main event match. Uh, Jay Uso versus Ilya Dragunov versus Pete Dunne versus Braun Strowman. Winner gets the shot at Braun. I'm sorry. Yeah, the winner gets the Intercontinental Championship match against Braun Breaker. Story for me here, the return of one, ooh, excuse me, Bronson Reed. Bronson Reed literally just comes out of nowhere and just splashes Braun Strowman to basically effectively take him out of the match. For me, I was pretty sure Jay Uso was going to win, but I was kind of waiting for Braun Strowman to get attacked by uh, Bronson Reed, which they did in this manner basically taking him out the way that he took him out a couple weeks before, jumping it off of him onto the car. I thought this was a good way to probably lead into a bad blood match. Hopefully this all leads into Bronson Reed going over. One of the things that I will say about this, that one of the reasons I want Bronson Reed to go over, there feels like there's a lack of really dangerous heels in WWE. You have some. You have the Gunthers of the world, but then you you need a, another one, maybe even a third, to really feel like, you know, a title, whoever the, is the champion, world champion on either brand, there's somebody else that's always, you know. Braun Breaker's a dangerous heel. Right now he is. Unfortunately, he's a mid-card champion. That ain't going to last long. As soon as he drops the title, they'll move him up. But, but Gunther you, elevated the title. Agree. He's not mid-card. He's upper mid-card. Fine, whatever you want to call him. Okay, I'm picking nits. Okay, he's a mid card champion. Unfortunately, at this point, when he does move up, you'll have that mega heel depth. This would, to me, 
it served two purposes. You get the Jey Uso Braun Breaker match that they've been teasing to, but this is the chance to elevate Braun. Uh, I'm sorry, Bronson uh, Reed over Braun Strowman, making him look strong and making him feel like the the mega heel that I've been waiting for him to be oh, in since he's been coming sent to WWE. Uh, Zach, um, who are you rooting for in this match? Uh, I mean, with Braun, I I mean, I like I like oh who was I written for for the the four way? Yeah. Oh, Ilya. Uh, just because I thought that would be a lot of fun re recapping another NXT rivalry. Uh, but um, yeah, I think Gozer did a great job with the IC title. Sammy as well. Um, Braun's doing a great job. That IC title means you know as much now as I feel like it did. Whenever I was a kid, I never saw it as a mid-card title or a secondary title. It was just another championship uh, and an important one, and I think that they've gotten that back. They have not done that with the U.S. title, but they have done it with the Intercontinental. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so uh, I think that Braun's going to beat Jay. Agreed. Uh, but I think they'll fight more than once. Oh, yeah, Jay does not need a belt. Like, no. No, he's, Jay would he's be a great right Intercontinental right. champion, but, like, what does he need that for? He just doesn't. He doesn't. He's not going to sell any more merch or anything. He yeah. would look good with that championship, though. That championship makes sense on him, though, also. I'm not saying he's going to beat Breaker. I'm saying he's not. I can see him holding it. He's going to the U.S. title yeah. on Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. I They're can see pro- him I mean, the U.S. They, they probably they just know that they have big WrestleMania plans. They have big lead up to WrestleMania. They got Survivor Series, Series coming Yeah, up, I was going to say Bloodline versus Bloodline is obviously the room, one of the rumored matches, so maybe they're just holding him in, in pattern, too. Yeah. So, we'll see what happens. I think Jay and Damian end up with the... Or Jay and Damian, or maybe even Jay and uh, Sammy end up with the tag titles. Yeah, I mean... Against Judgment Day, taking them from Judgment Day. Um, just throwing it out there, and then we can move on to a, whatever you want to have as the three count. Motor, machi- Motor City Machine Guns, Lucha Brothers. One of the two, at least, Motor City Machine Guns, for what I've read, they're on the way. They're signed. It's just a matter of plugging them in. We're, really? Yeah, they're going to WWE for everything I've read. Now? That's going to be a really good NXT match. <laughs> Lucha Brothers. They're getting the Motor Machine Motor City Machine Guns in 2024. From what I've read, <laughs> it's basically done. I mean, they can. Uh, I really think they're going to NXT though to like be veterans and coach and stuff. I don't. I don't think they're going to the main roster at all. Oh well, that would be well. That would be well. That would be kind of weird too. Mm, would it? I guess. I mean, maybe not. I mean, they're they're pretty old, right? Like AJ's age. That's pretty old, man. It's pretty old. Yeah, Lucha Brothers is the other team that I was going to throw out there just as for well, life, man. Just for life, uh, as a team that could be uh, WWE bound. Mm. I, I'm not necessarily saying that if they do go over, they win the tag titles, but. Once again, this feels like a, a plug and play scenario where if they did go over and you did put them on the main roster, it would be hard for me not to see them as tag champs on either brand, whatever, however you want to slice it or dice it. AJ is a full yeah, five. Dragon and- Lee. AJ. Lucha House Party. Oh, stop. Oh, oh stop. Stop it. <laughs> stop. See, you stereotype it, man. There you go. <laughs> AJ was born in uh, 1977, Alex Shelley, 82, and Chris Saban, uh, 83. So he's a little bit older than them. Um, okay, I got to pull up this fucking. I thought I had this PWI 500 pulled up. Hold on a second, everybody. Jason, do a uh, do an ad for F&B Eatery. Uh, F&B Eatery on the corner <laughs> of... <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, oh, I'm not trying to... I wasn't trying to be mean. No, it's not, unfortunately. No, um, no, I just don't live in the city anymore, so I was just curious. No, I know, but that just makes me feel like I was being mean. No, it, it's, it's called filibustering, my brother. It's called filibustering. Um, Jesus Christ. How, how I was Speaking of things on Libby, uh, I subscribe to Pro Wrestling Illustrated on Libby. I also get the New Yorker, uh, the Atlantic. Uh, it's really nice. Um, 
all delivered uh, as soon as they're released. I, I have my it. library. It's I got great. it. I got it right here. Okay. All right. So let's get to that three count. Oh, no. I got to be really Two, close to it. Three. It's not up here. All right. So the three count, the PWI 500 came out this week uh, or came out today maybe. But um, let me uh, read to you the top ten. We got Cody Rhodes at number one, Swerve Strickland at two, Osprey at three, Rollins at four, Naito at five, Damian Priest at six, MJF at seven, John Moxley at eight, Gunther at nine, and Mystico at ten. Zach, we'll start with you. Okay, so hang on. What? What? Okay, Jason. What? No, 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 right, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not saying I want to start. I'm saying what? What are the parameters of this? Is this based off of what has happened this year in in 2024, or are we doing it like they've done it in pro wrestling? illustrated list in the past where it goes from like you know august of 2023 yeah, to you know I, august of 2024 I don't, I don't have the parameters in front of me but um it is something like that it starts in the summer and ends yeah. in the summer okay so yes let, let's go with that zach you august can start. 1st 2023 to july 31st 2024 that's the that's, that's the, the evaluation standard. period okay the, the, here's the primary criteria. In-ring achievements, so win-loss records, championships, and tournaments. Influence, which is visibility and prestige within the promotion or industry. Technical ability. Competition, which means success against the most varied and highest quality opponents. And activity, minimum 10 singles, non-tag matches total. Or, barring that, six such matches in uh, separate months. Um yeah, so that's the that's the rundown. So, what jumped out to you, Zach? Uh, I mean, Swerve being number two is awesome. Um, you know, he had a, a great lead up to uh, his championship win, uh, and he was like the most over guy in the promotion. Uh, and it's really cool to see him recognized as such. He's the most over guy last year in the number two promotion. And he's number two to the most over guy in the number one promotion that like, that like makes sense uh, to me. Um, Naito being number five uh, was interesting just because yeah, he had some wins. Uh, he was, you know, champion. Um, he's the most over guy in the promotion, but man, that seems high. <laughs> But uh, I don't take a lot of stock in these. I think it would be very fun to put together in a kayfabe uh, scenario. But um, but it's but not yeah, all it's, kayfabe, uh, though. That's the thing. It's not all kayfabe. And what surprises me when I look at this list is there's no Roman Reigns. I mean, if it's summer to summer, Roman Reigns held the belt for until April of this year. Oh, and it's pretty year. interesting that he's not in the top ten. And had a massive, massive build. It was an event. Maybe it's because he just had so few matches. That's the only thing I, I can mean, think of. Yeah. While while we're at it, I, I went to Twitter to try to find the top ten because it seemed easier than Google at the moment. And the first tweet I see is some dick bag <laughs> saying PWI five hundred top ten is out. Have fun bitching about a kayfabe list again. Have fun bitching about a kayfabe list yet again, like the petulant goofs you are. This Aren't is what, you complaining? This, oh, oh, oh. this is why I don't get on fucking wrestling Twitter, man. <laughs> are, it's like you complaining? It's like it's a bunch of fucking people just yucking your yum, man. And they're the mark. Hey, they're marks that, too. I hate it. It just makes me feel so bad. Do you want to take a guess of where Roman ended up? Sixteen. Twelve. Um, I'll let you know when I find it because I am okay. still wow. scrolling. Uh, oh, and I mean, I'm looking. He's not at 11 through 20. Uh, uh, so Priest at 6. He, Eddie Kingston is higher than Roman Reigns. Well, I mean, that seems like somebody's got an axe to grind. <sighs> okay. I feel like this has to be an oversight because he's not in the top 40. I mean, he's Seth, Seth Rollins is higher on this list. Then Roman Reigns? What kind of fucking sense does that make? The World Heavyweight Championship run. Uh, 
has to be considered into this, I'm assuming, um, you know, basically establishing it and carrying it to this point. There's got to be some you know, some merit to that. Now, how much stock you put into it, I'll let you uh, I'll let you decide on that. I don't. Naido is the one. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. This, that is that blows my motherfucking mind. There ain't no way you can sit up here and tell me he won the G1. Man. He won at Wrestle Kingdom. <laughs> I'm just making the case, man. No, that ain't enough. That is not enough. I am sorry. That dude Don't is... Don't shoot the messenger. I, look, you just going to have to take one in the kneecap, man. You be all right. Walk it off. Man, no. He he shouldn't be on this list. I'm sorry. Oh, Ro- here. So, Roman did not wrestle enough matches in the evaluation period. He's not on the list at all. Okay. All right. Come on, man. And Naido's at five? Okay. Tell it how you want to tell it. Where just, would you put Roman? He's got to be in this top ten. I mean, oh, yeah. that, now for where where you want to put him? I'll let you tell it. For me, I don't necessarily. Ha- I don't have a problem with any of the top three guys. He Cody, the, he was the top star in the top promotion for the entire year. I would put him at number five where Nigel is, and then bump number five uh, or bump Nigel out of the top ten. I, okay, I mean, that, that's a nice starting point. I, I gotta say, Damian Priest at six just seems weird to me. No, I was getting ready to say the WrestleMania win. I mean, he cashed in. He won the title. You know, there's he is a world champion. Not too much you go. I can say too much around that. Yeah. Where's Logan Paul? Was Logan Paul on the list? Did he wrestle enough? Uh, he is on the list. He was pretty far down, though. Um, here, I can open this up. Do you guys want to hear? Just do, the, um, just do 11, 11 through 20. 11 through 20? Yeah. 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 All right, 11 through 20. 11, Samoa Joe. 12, Sami Zayn. 13, Drew McIntyre. 14, Brian Danielson. 15, Moose. 16, Sonata. 17, Jay Uso. 18, uh, Bill Veggie's favorite wrestler, Hio Del Vikingo. Uh, 19, Mustafa Ali. Mm. 20, Eddie Kingston. Mustafa Ali, number 19, that stands out to me. Um... NXT, uh, not NXT, I'm sorry, TNA uh, X Division champion. Moose, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, he won the their heavyweight title. So neither one of those, I'm, you know, for me, I'm just glad that TNA got guys in the top 20. So, you know, at least says that somebody is watching that, you know, I can't just say I watch every week, but I have, I would be lying if I did not say I watched uh, Josh Alexander versus, um, Nick Nemeth, the uh, hour-long Iron Man match. If you haven't watched it, I thought that that's a pretty good watch. Um, Nick Nemeth versus who? Can I just watch the last Josh like, Alexander. 10 minutes? Uh, <laughs> like... No, you you can, you can, but it it's it's kind of like it, in this scenario, it, it feels like a New Japan match. It, it, you probably want to go like fifteen, maybe twenty minutes back. All right, and, and look, I obviously know who Mister Co is. Um, you know, it's not like I don't know somebody who's not in the top ten. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like Vikingo. I know who Mystico is, but why is Mystico number 10? Is he the AAA champ? Uh, he's, no, he's CMLL. He's the biggest star in Mexico. And uh, CMLL is hot. They sell out uh, Arena Mexico every single Friday night. They don't sell out every Friday night, but they sell out some, some Friday nights. But they fill, they fill an arena in the same arena in the same city every Friday. Um, and he's the biggest star, um, and it's the oldest promotion currently running in the world. Well, him being above Vikingo on this list is criminal. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. How are you gonna do, my boy, like that? I mean, to tell you, man, you about to say I was waiting for you to speak up. I, I thought he was all bullshit aside. I thought like Vikingo was hurt for an, you know an extended period of time, and maybe this fell into that evaluation period of you know their year to year evaluation. So. That might have something to do with it. I would, I'll lean towards Zach's ex- explanation of things where Mystico is their biggest star of the oldest promotion. So, you know, it kind of makes sense for uh, him to be I wonder if Osprey has tweeted at Rollins yet about being ahead of him on the list. <laughs> that was Osprey, not number one. I mean, I guess I mean, Osprey's matured. Yeah. Look at him. Unbelievable. Um, 
uh, Cody winning WrestleMania is is a huge fucking deal. It it I mean that's all we Obviously, talked about. I, I mean Cody's the only number one. Pleasantly surprised that Swerve at two was uh, he, him being ahead of Osprey, but the, having the the kayfabe head to head win is a nice little tiebreaker. Osprey at three, no problem with that. Now, if you want to be banging the drum for Roman Reigns, four might be the start of it. Definitely at five, he, he definitely usurps Naida. I, I don't mean, give a fuck with nobody. It, it's, it's silly that Roman Reigns isn't on the list at all. The evaluation evaluation is what it is. I mean. It's not enough matches. Do I get it? Yeah. Do I agree? Hell no. All right. Uh, any other? It is funny. In 2023, they did. I think it was 2023. I think it was last year. They left Naito off by accident. Right. Uh, which is why I thought it'd be really funny if they left Reigns off by accident. Leaving Naito off by accident is uh, it's a real feather in the cap. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's going to do it for our three count. I remember a year ago, I was so pissed off about that. Now, a year later, I'm just like, how's he at number five? <laughs> I know. I mean, that's true. You turned on your boy. I did, man, like a motherfucker. I'm sorry. It's justified. It, he has not been good this year. So we talked about the bloodline getting involved in Axiom and Nathan Fraser versus Street Profits. Are Axiom and Nathan Fraser a proper tag team? They have won me over. Yes, they they feel like a good tag team. They they them and the Street Profits had a really good curtain jerk on NXT. I was a little disappointed that the Bloodline broke it up, but ultimately I was glad for them because the Bloodline needs some heat on them. So yeah, I think yes, they are a proper tag team. I liked the match that they had with the Street Profits. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, um, Nathan Fraser just he can go. He he can fucking move, man. He is fast. Um, did you watch that NXT, boy Zach? That boy fast. Uh, no, but I will. I, I would have. I've been watching it, but um, I had a stupid, crazy work week. I watched Dynamite up until the, the gauntlet match ended about 30 seconds before you called me. So, um, uh, Evans fights Dempsey uh, for the Heritage Cup, and uh, Tavion Heights comes back. Uh, Jason, do you know who Tavion Heights is? Yeah, actually, uh, he was over in Japan wrestling in Pro Wrestling Noah's uh, N1 tournament, the equivalent of the G1 from New Japan. Apparently, he had some good matches. Uh, I think he beat uh, one of their top stars in Keno. So there was a, a lot of buzz for him coming back, and I was thinking to myself watching this match, well, I mean, wonder if Taylor Heights is coming back tonight. And obviously, he got involved in the match to help Charlie Dempsey uh, go over. I have a lot of expectations for Tavion Heights. He has, obviously, a wrestling background, which would help him immensely here. He has the look. He has the side. So it's it's there to be had. He's just got to get that push. Um, Hammerstone comes to job out to Obafemi. Uh, is he just Hammerstone now? He's not Alex Hammerstone? He is just Hammerstone now. Um, I'm sure that has a lot to do with the fact of him leaving MLW and them having some sort of copyright over the Alex Hammerstone name, neither here nor there. I was pleasantly surprised with this. Uh, the last person I thought, but a little disappointed because I like Alex Hammerstone a lot. Uh, I didn't want to see him job out to Obafemi, but I get it. You know, you yeah, gotta man. you gotta build Obafemi up. This was a way to do it. It was a crossover between brands. Uh, obviously, we saw more of that with Wesley and uh, Zachary Wentz later on in the uh, the show or whatever. So, I mean, it's this the crossover is working because now I feel like if I don't watch Impact, I'm missing something that comes back up on NXT, and I'm like, what? What? How this happened? I'm I'm getting mad. So. For me, it's working. Uh, Jordan Grace versus Sol Ruka. They get interrupted by Rosemary and Chu. No uh, sense at all. Wendy Chu is one of those people that shows up on pro wrestling where I'm like, oh, fuck, why am I watching this? But uh, And then finally, Trick Williams uh, wins a last man standing match against Pete Dunne. Ethan Page is there at the end. Um, were you surprised at this finish? No, just wish the match would have went longer. All right, that's going to do it for our odds and ends. Very short uh, week of birthdays this week, but we do have some birthdays this week. Happy birthday to my mother. She turned 70. Happy birthday, Mama Peggy. Uh, Road Warrior Animal turned 64. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, Baron Corbin is turning 40. Teddy Long, holla, 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 holla. Let me holla at you, girl. 77. Um, Adrian Adonis. R.I.P. Would have been 70. And Jim Cornette. Talk about He is bitching. He is somewhere bitching about the PWI 500. Like a <laughs> petulant little baby that he is. Fever. Hey, everybody. You know there's tons of podcasts here, too. So we appreciate you guys listening to our podcast for Tender Mahal. Go check out his show this weekend. Check. For Lucia Chris. Check. For Murray the Murray Man Murray. For check. Patriot Pep. Check. For Brett Jagger. Check. For Vice. Check. For Two Beers, Zach Coleman. Check. For Jason Cornelius Bell. Can eat you bitches. Bill Beggy. Check. Black Lives Matter. Check. Support your local weed dealers. Check. Support your local restaurant. Double check. Give your parents a call. Check. Free fucking Palestine. Triple check. And never, never <coughs> forget to boo the heels. Boo!